the Honorable <laughs> Premier. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues for another week of debate in the Legislative Assembly. Uh, I want to begin by welcoming those who have joined us in the public gallery today, uh, carrying hardware, uh, <laughs> which I know is hard-earned. Uh, uh, I want to welcome uh, members of the Mid-Isle Matrix Under-18 uh, AAA uh, team who won the Island Championship uh, uh, recently. Uh, the final game going to four periods, I believe, of overtime before they were able to, uh, uh, to uh, knock off, uh, uh, off, off the, the central attack, I, I believe. And uh, a lot of the young lads there I know, I think that's Liam Boswell with the trophy, my buddy Bozzy. <laughs> So, uh, well, I happened to coach in junior high ball last year, and I see my coaching skills have, uh, <laughs> at least he was wise enough to grab the trophy. So that's all I should In the history, Bozzy, of, uh, when you look back on this, you'll have the trophy, and uh, you'll be in all the photos, and you'll be able to tell them all the things that you did, and, uh, and that's wonderful. But I know it's been a tough year for a lot of... Uh, uh, of our hockey players, and I just want to say congratulations to the players, the staff, uh, the parents, and all of those who, who made it uh, who made it happen. That, that's a wonderful accomplishment, and uh, happy to see a championship at Mid Isle. Uh, the member from Montague Kilmere, Mr. Speaker, as you may know, is the coach of the Kings County Under 18 team, and uh, I notice he hasn't made his way to the legislature yet. <laughs> I suspect that trophy has scared them off a little bit, and uh, maybe that's a tougher pill for, for him to swallow. But uh, uh, I want to say uh, congratulations uh, to, to the Matrix, and uh, job well done. On the weekend, Mr. Speaker, we were uh, uh, happy to, to learn that uh, Michelle Neal was uh, elected as the leader of the Island New Democratic Party, uh, three years to the day uh, from the date of the, of, of the provincial election of 2019. Uh, Michelle is a constituent in the district that I represent, uh, Brackley uh, Hunter River. I think we'll put her in the uh, uh, undecided category when it comes to votes <laughs> in the next election, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but uh, uh, she will uh, do a wonderful job. Uh, I had a great relationship with Joe Byrne, the, the previous leader, who was a, a tremendous social leader. And I know Michelle is a, a tremendous social advocate and leader as well. And I want to wish her uh, all the best in her job ahead. Uh, all the voices of Islanders from different political views, Mr. Speaker, uh, have to play an important role into the style of government that we have developed here in PEI. And I look forward to the contributions of Michelle and others in the Island New Democratic Party in the days ahead. <clears throat> I was my pleasure yesterday to attend the uh, PEI Federation of Municipalities uh, meetings. I know the f leader of the official opposition spoke to that crowd as well, uh, uh, min the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, and I think the Minister of Social Development and Housing was out there as well. Uh, it was nice to have that uh, meeting in person for the first time in three years. And it's always nice to be surrounded by leaders in communities, large and small. Uh, and we talked a lot about the collaboration that uh, we have and a lot of the collaboration that we're going to need to address some of the challenges facing all of us across Prince Edward Island. So it was nice uh, to be part of that. And from there, I had an opportunity to go into a very, very impressive development on Fitzroy Street in Charlottetown. The, the PEI chapter of the Canadian Mental Health Association is, of course, building a, a, a rapid housing initiative there. It's amazing. Uh, we drove by last Thursday, there was just a foundation. Now there's three levels on there. Uh, it's really, really incredible. And it was nice to talk to Shelley Mazika and others from the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association to talk about how proud they are, not just of the building, but all of the wraparound services that they're able to provide for those who will make that uh, uh, location home in, in August. And uh, uh, everyone who I was there with talked about how we should be doing more of this, not just in Charlottetown, but all across Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. And I couldn't agree more. And I look forward to more of these projects in the future. I want to wish all of my colleagues a productive day, and once again, go Matrix. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Down the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to welcome everybody back for another week in the House here. And of course, uh, welcome to our special guest, Mid on Matrix. Congratulations on, on your win. And I see sitting right at the end of the group there is Sandy Slade. And I'm going to go out on a limb here, Sandy, and suggest you're probably a little old for this team. <laughs> um, but you're, you may be there independently. I, I, either way, so I don't know if you're a hockey player or not, Sa uh, Sandy, but it's lovely, lovely to see you here. Uh, I'd also like to pass on my congratulations to Michelle Neal, who took over leadership of the Island New Democratic Party on the weekend. Uh, Michelle, of course, has, has run in previous uh, elections, I believe the last federal election she ran here as the NDP candidate in Malpec. And I look forward to see, I'm sure she will 
be in this house. Um, like all of us who start in a, in a third party, it will, it will start in the, in the gallery, uh, sitting outside the rail. But I, I hope that uh, in the years ahead that we have a chance to debate all of the issues at up upcoming uh, leaders' debates and various events across the island. So congratulations to Michelle. Um, as the Premier said, the, the Federation of PEI Municipalities had their AGM uh, on the uh, yesterday, sorry, yesterday. And it's, it is always nice to sit down with the, uh, the leaders, the municipal leaders across our province here, the mayors and the councillors and, of course, the staff of the many municipalities that uh, offer local governance here on Prince Edward Island. And I really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to speak with them. I've done that for many years now, and it was lovely to get back face-to-face -face, uh, with, with those organizations again and those individuals. Had some great chats, enjoyed listening to the minister and others who were, who were present to offer remarks. And uh, I want to wish Bruce McDougall and John Dewey and Sanjajit Sam and uh, all of the people involved with the PEI Federation of Municipalities, uh, all the best in the year ahead, and thank them for the fantastic work that they do at a community level for the citizens of this province. And in my own district, and I mentioned this in my remarks uh, yesterday, the new rural municipality of West River uh, is in the final stages of developing their land use plan and their, and their uh, development bylaws. And they've done a fantastic job. And I, again, I cited this yesterday. It's been an inclusive process. It's been a thoroughly democratic process. And it's been very thorough. It's, it's taken a long time. And I think it's a real model of how municipalities can come together to provide um, a sufficient size of community to offer the services locally and have the capacity to manage that. And I, I want to thank the uh, members of that council for the, the hard work they've done. And I specifically want to single out uh, Lala Jahansalu, who is the CAO of that new municipality. And yes, we need wonderful elected representatives to move issues like that forward and, and to improve communities. But having fantastic staff like Lala is, is, uh, is a real necessity as well. And I spoke to many staff members yesterday from various municipalities. And I want to thank them, too, for the contributions they make. Uh, the municipality of West River is holding uh, this afternoon, actually starting at 2 o'clock, an open house in Afton Hall for residents of the area to go in and have a look at the new updated draft plan. And it will be also open this evening from 6.30 to 8.30, I believe. Uh, and I'm certainly going to drop in this evening. Obviously, I'm a little busy this afternoon, but I will be there this evening. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new updated plan and to meeting my neighbors and friends in the area and, uh, and to look at that. And finally, it, it, was, uh, it was a weekend, well, it was a full weekend, social weekend, and that's something that I had certainly have not been used to for, for a long time. I attended a, a number of events, beautiful events, and I'm going to single out a couple of them. One at the Watermark Theatre, where I saw a play, um, a two-hander play, and it was spectacularly good, uh, Mr. Speaker. It was called Lungs, and it was put on by two uh, actors a really moving piece of theatre. And uh, I hadn't seen live theatre for a very long time. And you forget what a wonderful craft that is, particularly when it's performed as beautifully as it was at the Watermark Theatre. So congratulations to everybody involved in that production. And on Sunday, I attended, uh, along with the Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance and probably others in this house. It was a huge crowd. The Confederation Centre main stage auditorium was full. Um, a concert put on by the PEI Symphony Orchestra on behalf of Ukraine. And there was some beautiful music, firstly, of course, from the orchestra, but also some lovely speeches, particularly from a couple of young women, Ukrainian women, who opened the event by telling a little bit about their personal story and how much this meant that the island came together and offered this, firstly, this beautiful performance, which included Ukrainian music and some Ukrainian performers, but also that the island came together for the significant fundraiser. I don't know how much they raised, but it will be a large amount of money. And they were clearly very moved. And the speeches that they both gave, and obviously a sec second language for them, were, were really moving and very articulate. So that was, a, that was a special event for me, and that will stay with me for a very long time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and as always, it's a pleasure to rise and welcome everyone back 
for another week. I'd certainly like to welcome everyone into the gallery, a special welcome to the mid Isle Matrix, and congratulations on your victory. Also, we have a special guest in the gallery today, Star of Justice. Welcome. I'm sure it uh, feels like familiar territory from your time here, although it's kind of a duplicate of next door. It's not exactly the, what you sat in, but it's great to see you here today. Mr. Speaker, I too would like to congratulate uh, Michelle Neal on, Neil on winning the leadership of the NDP party and wish her all the best going forward. And Mr. Speaker, as the, the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition said, it was quite a pleasure to get out over the weekend and, and start seeing things open up and get the functions. On Friday night, I had the pleasure, along with some of my colleagues, to attend the PI Construction Association's gala dinner. It was wonderful to see the positivity in the room and see people we hadn't seen for a while, and I wish that industry all the best this summer. Mr. Speaker, uh, myself and the member from Larry Inverness and the member from uh, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke attended some hockey over the weekend in Tyne Valley, as we talked about last week. And I, got, I really want to send out my congratulations to the Western Wind on their bronze medal victory, especially to Gracie Green and who lives on my street that got the winning goal in the 3-2 victory. It was great hockey. The Nova Scotia team went on to win the goal, but uh, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And uh, I thank all the organizers. And uh, the 50-50 was, uh, was phenomenal each game because of volunteers. And it was just great to see all what everybody put into the tournament. Also, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Dickness Palmer Road for attending the Federation Municipalities meeting yesterday on our behalf. It's always a pleasure to hear their views, and uh, we had a brief discussion this morning on it, and uh, I wish them all the best going forward with the Federation. As we all know, the rural municipalities uh, do a lot of work for their citizens, and I wish them all the best going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all my colleagues. Hello to everyone watching from all around the island. A special good morning, or I guess not good morning, good afternoon to Sandy Slade and the team sitting along beside him. Congratulations. Um, Mr. Speaker, I was very excited to see that the Diversity Multicultural Festival has announced all their dates and locations. They'll be in five different locations, Charlottetown, Summerside, Evangeline, uh, Montague and Alberton between June 26th and July 31st. They're looking for volunteers and I've signed up and hope you will too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, today I will be acknowledging National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week that is being held from April 24th to April 30th this year. This week raises awareness about the critical need for more donors across the country and does encourage Canadians to register their decision and to talk to their loved ones about organ donation. Mr. Speaker, since 2015, over 47,000 Islanders and counting have said yes to becoming an organ and or tissue donor. Mr. Speaker, I encourage people to visit makeitzero.ca for more information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and welcome everyone watching from District 18, Rustico Emerald, and all my colleagues, and of course, everyone in the gallery. And I, too, wanted to recognize the, uh, the UE18 uh, AAA Mid-Isle Matrix for their, their big win. My son, Alex, uh, plays with the U13 group. And, and of course, he said, we have to go and see this final game, Dad. And I said, fine. And I had uh, some errands to run. I, I, I was disappointed because I only made it for about the last 10 minutes of the third period. But little did I know, I would get to see a whole other hockey game <laughs> before the things were done. So we stayed right to the end and enjoyed it. Great work, guys. And um, I, I'm not sure exactly who's in the gallery here with the masks and everything. But I did want to recognize uh, some of the players that are from District 18, Rustico Emerald. Uh, um, Evan Andrews, Nolan Cobb, Jacob Doucette, Zach Langdale, Will Lowther, Gabe Tweel, and uh, uh, Ryder Howitt, whose younger brother plays with my son. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to recognize uh, Sandy Slade as well from ADHDPI and the great work that hey, he Mr. does. And uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Listen, I didn't put the rule in there. I'm just here to administrate it. The 
The Honorable <laughs> Charlottetown Winslow. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, welcome to, of course, all of our guests here in the gallery, as well as anyone who's watching from District 10, Charlottetown Winslow. Friday afternoon, as the Honorable Leader mentioned, it's nice to be able to get out to see different events. I had a chance to stop by the UPEI Faculty of Sustainable Engineering Design Expo on the campus at UPEI. I was simply blown away, Mr. Speaker. I didn't get a chance to see every single one uh, of all the group's presentations, but there were, the talent was unbelievable. There was uh, numerous community fridges. Uh, beach dunes uh, preservation, uh, things that they had designed, as well as even lighting at Cavendish. And I, I just wanted to make mention uh, in this house of all the great work that was done by all of the UPEI students of engineering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to rise to say congratulations to the Mid-Isle Matrix team. And uh, we had some excellent hockey in Time Valley, as the leader of the third party mentioned uh, this weekend. Uh, and congratulations to the Western Wind uh, on their uh, bronze uh, medal win. I also want to mention, between going to all those hockey games, I got to stop in at a yard sale at the Center Bell Alliance that was in support of the people of Ukraine. And at that yard sale, they raised over $11,000, oh, is what I'm told. Really significant. Uh, I also want to just recognize Maria Pogi, sorry, Marina Pogi, who uh, designed these beautiful t-shirts uh, and all the proceeds go to support the people of Ukraine. So if you get a chance to get one of these t-shirts, uh, I highly recommend them. I bought one and I'm looking forward to wearing it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You got a lot out in 40 seconds. <laughs> the Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, speaker, hope your stopwatch is broke, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to actually recognize uh, somebody we have in the gallery here today, Stafford Eustace. He actually served as an assemblyman in this legislative assembly in the other building uh, back between 1984 and 1996 with, uh, with Libby Hubley, of course, one of the, one of the Fab Five, and uh, Stafford has a, quite a reputation around the district and uh, somebody that I've always looked up to, and, and uh, he's always been, any time I've ever talked in the past to him, he's always been a a great man of wisdom and uh, appreciate all the service that he gave to this house during his years. So thank you very much, Stafford. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last Saturday I had the pleasure to meet with the PI Woodlot Owners Association. They are basically, together with their trees, the lungs of PEI, a uh, really worthwhile group. Uh, they were all excited about the future option of getting paid to grow trees through carbon credits. And I hope the government makes that happen as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I'll be quick. I want to welcome everyone back to the House, welcome everyone from District 4. Lots of lobster traps on the wharf, and it's great to see. We look forward to a wonderful season. I want to also mention uh, the symphony on Sunday, it was very, very moving. And uh, when the Ukrainian choir, Prince of Rhode Island's Ukrainian choir, got up and sang the Ukraini Ukrainian national anthem, it really was very, very moving. And uh, equally as moving was Richard Wood and the symphony playing Leaving Store. And I think it's an Irish Strass Bay, but being a Scot, I, I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was pretty darn good. <laughs> and uh, it was very, very moving. The whole concert. Uh, very well done, and great to see the people out supporting that. Welcome the mid Matrix, and congratulations. I remember those days when my son played and how exciting it was. And uh, wish everyone a great day. Thank you. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Oh, bonjour, uh, Mr. Speaker. Et je veux faire mon chose en français aujourd'hui parce que vendredi soir, on est allé à une fonction uh, pour parler français pour les parents qui parlent français. So, j'ai dit que je vais essayer de parler un peu plus français. Um, bien fait, les gars. Uh, bonjour, Kate uh, McKenna, qui est ici aujourd'hui. Et um, je, voulais, je voulais juste dire que je n'ai pas d'autre chose à faire parce que je, je n'étais pas prêt pour parler pour Merci. Did I miss anyone? The Honourable Member from Monaco, Kilmore, and uh, Government Whip. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thought I'd get up. I heard I was in the lunchroom and the Premier was chirping me a bit there. So. Um, but uh, congratulations, gentlemen. It was uh, very well earned. Uh, definitely, definitely the top team. So uh, well earned. And is that Chelsea in the gallery? I see. Hello, Chelsea. Welcome. And I just, I was at the ESO this morning in Montague filling up, and I ran into Newman Steele. Um, he's a buyer down in Graham's Pond. And Newman is, uh, just found out that his cancer is back. So he's, uh, he's battling cancer again. Um, 
but all, you'd have to know Newman well. They're, the Steels are big liberals down and uh, down that way. And he said, well, Corey, he said, if, uh, you know, if I'm not around for the next election, you might win by one more vote. He said, <laughs> but in all, you'd have to know Newman's sense of humor. That's the way he is. But I want to wish Newman all the best. And I do hope that he's able to fight this one off. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Never missed anyone. The member statement, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take this opportunity to congra congratulate PEI's newest nonprofit organization, ADHD PEI. Sandy Slade, who lives with ADHD, set out to find some support and resources for himself. When he found there were none, he decided to do something about it and has been passionately building this organization from the ground up off the side of his desk since 2018. ADHD PEI's work is divided into three aspects, peer support, education, and advocacy. They currently offer weekly and bi-weekly peer support groups in Charlottetown, Summerside, and online. These groups have made some huge breakthroughs for individuals. These groups have, uh, sorry, Sandy tells me how many times he hear things, hears things like, oh my gosh, I do the same thing. I thought I was just bad at insert whatever thing here, which of course takes a toll on a person's self-esteem and self feelings of self-worth. The normalization and support people receive from this group is literally changing lives. Dr. Wong estimates that ADHD affects close to 7,000 Islanders, many of whom are undiagnosed. We know that in school-aged children, ADHD is mostly diagnosed in boys. Boys tend to be more on the hyperactive side, whereas the girls, generally, are still able to sit quietly and comply. School is a lot about classroom management, and so unfortunately, the students who are the most disruptive are prioritized. As a result, what we are seeing in PEI at the moment is high numbers of adult women who are being diagnosed mm -hmm. or believe they may have ADHD, myself included. There are some big plans for this organization, starting with something as simple as a website with frequently asked questions about living with ADHD. A little normalization and support goes a long way, and I would like to thank Sandy Slade, Sandy Slade and ADHD PEI for their work in caring for and supporting Islanders who live with ADHD. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week is Volunteer Week in Canada, and this year's theme is Empathy in Action. We've spoken many times before in this House about the importance of volunteers to the province, whether it's through service clubs like Wise Men, Lions, Rotary, Women's Institute, as a board member for a non-profit organization, church or charity, as a coach or organizer or leader for sports, arts, festivals and events, and of course, emergency responders, including firefighters, the Red Cross, search and rescue. People of all ages from across the province give thousands of hours to others every single year. Without volunteers, there are programs, services and events that just would not happen. Think about what our province would look like without our volunteers. How can we then encourage and support Islanders to start or continue to volunteer? After some very difficult months and years, may, many Islanders in the volunteer sector are burning out too. The Community Service Bursary for high school students who volunteer is a great start to encourage new volunteerism, though it would be even better if eligible organizations could be extended beyond only registered charities to include many other worthy NGOs that currently are not eligible to participate. We know that engaging youth early helps set patterns and behaviors that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. And volunteering can also help someone learn new skills or explore a field without committing to it long term, as you might in a job or an internship. Volunteering is essential to our economy. This unpaid labor is offered for public service, religious or humanitarian objectives without the expectation of compensation. Fundamentally, volunteering is a selfless act that intends to benefit others, not necessarily the volunteer, a true act of empathy. But volunteering can also help us develop empathy, building our capacity to work collectively and contribute to a vibrant, inclusive society. I ask everyone to consider taking time during National Volunteer Week to celebrate, <coughs> acknowledge, and say thanks to the volunteers in your community and across the province, and think about how you can volunteer and contribute too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, 
The honorable member from Cornwall, Meadowbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think I've learned an important lesson today. Uh, keep your guests out in the hallway until after greetings so they don't, people don't steal your thunder <laughs> from you. <laughs> so there'll be some redundancy today in my member statement. As you all know, many in the House we are big hockey fans. We often recognize teams and tournaments, but we want to make extra special recognition of the U18 AAA Mid-Isle Matrix team. They won the PEI uh, AAA Male Hockey Championship on April 20th, but it's the way that they won it that made it extra special. The Matrix defeat the Central Attack 4-3 in the fourth overtime period to win the best of finals three games to one. The game capped an extremely close final. All four games were decided by one goal. I was at that game, Mr. Speaker. It started at 6.40 p.m. And, was, and the winning goal, scored by Carson McDougal, was scored over four hours and seven periods later at 10.45. It was Carson's second game-winning goal in the series. I want to be the first one to call him Clutch McDougal from now on. Noah Visser, who lives up the street from me, was a Matrix goaltender who stopped nearly 70 shots in these seven, seven periods. Mr. Speaker, I have to admit, I wasn't sure if I wanted them to win game four, as game five was going to be played back at 8 p.m. I just had the opportunity to put up a rink board advertisement <laughs> at the rink, and I was hoping for a big game for game five. <laughs> so I was hoping everybody would see my big face on the boards in game five. Next season, we'll have to do. I want to recognize the coaches as well. I don't think every, anyone, everyone understands the time commitment that these people make. It's basically a part-time job from October to April. Our own honorable member from Montague Kilmere coaches in the same league, but obviously didn't get his name on the trophy this season. I'm sure we can arrange for a pitcher. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you to Matrix coaches Dylan Sanderson, Brody Irving, Justin McDonald, Chris Gallant, and Sam McPhail, and GM Thane McEwen. Another reason I want to recognize these young men is many of them hang around my house from time to time. They can certainly pack away the groceries, Mr. Speaker. In all seriousness, this is a great group of young, young men, and they are welcome at my house anytime. I also want to recognize the graduating players, some who can't be here today as they are down south on their grade 12 Bluefield trip. These graduating players include Noah Visser, Jaden Murphy, Jacob Dewey Doucet, Chris McDougall, Caden Trainer, and Miles Grant. Miles is a grandson of Ted Grant, who I've spoken about in this house before. And last but not last, last but not least, I want to recognize team captain Braden Tremere, who has played his last game of minor hockey. Braden always leads the way on the ice, and he's a frequent visitor at our house. He keeps us entertained when he's at our house, and I, and I sometimes send him a pep talk text before games. All jokes aside, Mr. Speaker, they should be congratulated on their win, and I wish all these young men the best of luck. Go Matrix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. On Friday afternoon, we saw a tourism funding announcement from ACOA, which included a $100,000 grant, and that's a grant free money. It's not a repayable loan. Go to Storybook Staples, a business that's owned by the Premier's wife and is located at the Premier's home. A question to the Premier, what involvement did you have in the awarding of this $100,000 grant to yourself? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, none. Uh, it's the business that's owned 100% by my wife, uh, Jana, uh, who I was happily married to uh, as of Sunday, 23 years. Uh, she's a strong, independent uh, entrepreneur, uh, a woman who knows what she wants, and she's been working passionately at it her whole life, Mr. Speaker. Uh, she doesn't need any help from me, uh, and I actually find the tone of the question very misogynistic, Mr. Speaker, that suggests that my wife would need me to do anything for her. Mr. Speaker, and my concern lies with all of the islanders who are very upset about this. There was quite an outcry over the weekend over this um, when it became known, and I think that's because islanders are experiencing an, an unprecedented rise in the cost of living, and yet they still haven't received that $150 check that was promised by them, to them by government six, six weeks ago. Those islanders are being forced to tighten their belts while at the same time 
the Premier's wife gets a $100,000 grant. Islanders are, I believe, understandably upset. A question to the Premier. Can you understand how this would be indeed upsetting to all those islanders who are struggling every day just to get by. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, it's, it's my wife's business. Uh, she uh, is very capable of doing things on her own. I can understand if people thought that I gave money to her where they would be upset. Uh, I think it's rather disappointing and really sickening to suggest that I had anything to do with this, Mr. Speaker. When the Honourable Leader of the Opposition sees my wife, he grabs her and hugs her and tells her how wonderful she is, Mr. Speaker. And this is, uh, this is uh, pretty uh, surprising that he would take this line of questioning, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Let me be clear on something here. Our job as opposition is to respond to what Islanders tell us. Mm -hmm. And hundreds, if not thousands, of Islanders express, they express their concern. Member has the floor. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The patient registry is a useful source of data. There now. There, 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 guys. Check it out now. Yes, the floor. Godless. Don't stop now. Yeah, unbelievably godless. Really? Unbelievable. He has the floor. It's unbelievable. He has the floor. Well, let's keep going with the questions. Don't stop now. Do you think I will Leader of the opposition has the floor. Listen. Unbelievable. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, that's Mr. it. Mr. Speaker. Not doing question time. The patient registry is a useful source of data, but it provides far from a full picture on the lack of access that tens of thousands of islanders have to primary health care. Robust and healthy systems have redundancies built into them so that when one area gets stressed, another part takes up the slack. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What parts of our healthcare system take up the slack when islanders lose their family doctor or nurse practitioner and yet they need access to primary health care? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And to give two examples would be 811, Mr. Speaker, and virtual health care, which this province has worked uh, for a number of years on, but certainly has expanded on in the last uh, two to three year period. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. When the family practitioner left Crapo a few years ago, the very clear message from Health PEI was that all South Shore residents who had lost their doctor should immediately put their names on the patient registry. The message from Health PEI to residents of West Prince on losing their GP seems to be the exact opposite. To the same minister, why the confusion and mixed messages, and what should Islanders, whether you live in Prince County or Queen's County or King's County, do when they lose their doctor or nurse practitioner? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the member of the Leader of the Opposition references and refers to uh, a physician who is leaving Tignish, Mr. Speaker. Over the next few months, there is locum coverage fair, Mr. Speaker. There are nurse practitioners that are going to be providing coverage, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, the leader of the opposition insinuates and wants these people to put their name on a patient registry when they are already being covered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the leader of the official opposition. I'm simply asking the minister what they should do because three years ago they were told to put their name on and now they're being told not to put their name on. So they're just looking for some clarity here. Clearly, if people lose their primary health care provider, uh, they are being told not to put their names on the patient registry. And if that's the case, the number of islanders without a doctor or a nurse practitioner is way higher 
than the already astronomical 23,000 that we know of. A question to the same minister, how many islanders actually are without access to primary care? Is it 25,000, 30,000? What is it? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it seems that the Honourable Leader of the Opposition wants to drive, uh, draw that analogy between the situation in the great community of Tignish and in a broader concept, Mr. Speaker. But I'll reiterate, Mr. Speaker, it is absolutely appropriate that the ones that were served by the family physician in West Prince, in Tignish, now that they do have coverage by locums, by uh, nurse practitioners over the foreseeable future, should not put their name on the patient registry, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent investigation by the CBC about the firing of two deputy chief administrative officers of the city of Charlottetown shows that there have been some very worrying decisions, financial irregularities, potential mismanagement, and an overall lack of transparency. As a result, there are many citizens of Charlottetown that do not feel their municipal government is serving them well. A question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Are you satisfied that the Charlottetown City Council is serving the citizens of Charlottetown well and upholding its legal obligations under the Municipal Government Act? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we have to remember here that uh, under the MGA, the uh, municipality of Charlottetown has the responsibility and the respect of this office to conduct any investigation into any matter that falls under human resources or similar type of venue. So I think we should let the city of Charlottetown um, follow their code of conducts and their bylaws and deal with internal or human resources matter under their own accord. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. Mr. Speaker, and uh, you're responsible for an act that says you have the authority to do these mm -hmm. types of reviews and investigations, Minister. These circumstances certainly should warrant the attention of the Minister of Communities, who is responsible for the Municipal Government Act. Many of these concerns were first raised by a former deputy CAO who acted as a whistleblower and was subsequently fired. A question to the Minister. Does your government condone firing whistleblowers? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we have to remember that under the MGA, the City of Charlottetown has the authority to deal with human resources matters. And as my best in my interest, I don't believe it's the, the, uh, the right of the Minister to go in and put a, a power on the Council when they have the authority to deal with it. Let the City of Charlottetown deal with their human resources matters and they will come to a resolution. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. I'm, I'm here, here. No evil, see no, see no evil, just you know, willful ignorance, Minister. A councillor who tried to press the issue had his pay suspended for violating the Code of Conduct. The maximum fine under the MGA for this kind of violation is $500, but the council imposed a penalty that resulted in a cost closer to $10,000. Question to the Minister. Why did you allow this penalty be, to be imposed, which seems to be a clear violation of the Act? You know, I have to laugh. I have to stand up and laugh at the opposition because they want the government to come in and be the strong arm and overpower people that are elected and have the power to deal with a matter. The city of Charlottetown has the authority under the MGA to review and investigate anything to do with human resources matter. And that is what I am going to intend to do. I am going to allow them to investigate. And if they request a minister investigate a matter or look into the matter, then we will look at that request if the MGA is broken and a law is, is not looked after. Thank you. Summerside says dry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I, I guess, you know, it was the former deputy CAO who requested a review uh, of this uh, and, and uh, has brought forward these allegations, so the minister should take note. A deputy CAO whistleblower fired. A councillor who spoke about the issues penalized beyond what our laws call for. The replacement deputy T CAO fired. It's clear that there's some serious issues going on with the management of Charlottetown City Council. 
At least one councillor, as well as members of the public, have called on the department to intervene and order an investigation into all this potential mismanagement, but the request was declined. Mm -hmm. What kind of message does that send? Question to the Minister. How many more requests for your intervention exist across PEI? And will you reverse this decision and order an investigation, or does your government condone what the CBC's investigation has uncovered? Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's quite sad. It's quite sad that the Honourable Member wants me, the Minister, to step in and not have the respect or not respect the, the actual power that the municipal government in Charlottetown has. He also tried to do the exact same thing in the past in the city of Summerside. So I think the Honourable Member should give these councillors and the mayors and the staff the respect they deserve to follow their code of conduct and also take care of human resource matters. Thank you. Summerside Wilmot. The Department of Education is expecting roughly a 30% increase in newcomer student enrollment this fall. A question to the Minister of Education. Could you confirm if that figure is correct? The Honourable Minister of Education, lifelong learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, uh, for the question. I will have to get back to the Department um, to inquire whether that number is accurate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The number of New Islanders has been on the rise, and that's a great thing. And it also requires planning to ensure best outcomes for families. I've heard from many English as an additional language teachers who are worried about not having an EAL consultant in the Department of Education and how that means EAL teachers don't have a seat at the table where decisions are being made. Question to the Minister of Education. With such significant increases, are you bringing an EAL consultant on staff? Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, uh, for the question. There certainly has been some additional strains and pressures on our EAL staff, and I know there have been ongoing discussions regarding um, the future of those roles and whether whether we need to staff up um, in terms of whether those dis positions should be based in the department or at the, the public schools branch. I think there's, again, those discussions are being had, and Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to bring back um, a more uh, detailed response to the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister's correct. There have been huge strains on EAL staff. And for most students on PEI, English is the language of instruction. So strong language skills are essential for their education. If we're not making adequate investments in EAL, we're effectively depriving newcomer students of the same opportunities as other students. To the same Minister, what are we doing to ensure that students have access to the same quality of education, regardless of their background? Honorable Master of Education, Lifelong Learning. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and really, our, our EAL, our FAL learners, they provide diversity and, and bring the world to our classrooms um, while embracing cultural and linguistic experiences, Mr. Speaker. And that's why it really has been such a priority for us as government to take a deep dive into um, the supports that are available to all of these newcomers, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, I spoke to some of the strains that it exist, and, and certainly through COVID, uh, there's only been added pressure. So this is a, an area of a focus for us, and I look forward to, to being able able to provide some more additional information to the House when that, that information is available. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I agree with the Minister. There are a number of issues that have been facing New Islanders, particularly in the schools. And it seems to me that school board elections would be a great, a great space to elevate those issues, except the Minister's amendments to transition to elected school boards include nothing that would allow newcomers to either run in those elections or vote in them. To the Minister of Education, why shouldn't newcomer families have the same opportunity to influence outcomes in education as other families? Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I know that this was a uh, an item or a topic that was discussed at the uh, the Home and School AGM this past weekend. And Mr. Speaker, we have been working with Elections PEI, and as through our you know municipal and provincial elections, currently um, that's not the practice whereby our um, 
are individuals who are not Canadian citizens. They're not able to vote, Mr. Speaker. But again, that's something that we can we can look at it. Um, I endeavor to, to have our first election here in September. And if we need to make changes beyond that, absolutely, we're willing to do that, Mr. Speaker. But I think, you know, September will be a good um, a good trial run for us and, and to see how many uh, individuals do come forward and, and put their na name forward as candidates as, as well and, and how many participate in voting. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question. Charlottetown, Belvin. There. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've asked many times um, in the House about the government's approach to income tax policy in question period, on the floor during legislative um, and estimates, and the main talking point is always about the PC platform commitment to increase the basic personal exemption. This year's basic, basic personal exemption increase provided islanders who pay tax with a personal income tax break of about $75 for the whole year. Question for the Minister of Finance. How does giving 21 cents a day help struggling islanders with the rising cost of living? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Honourable Member, this is just one of the ways that we were trying to help islanders. Uh, it's something that we did commit to, and we feel it's very important to uh, raise that for basic personal exemption. Uh, we, we've committed to that. We will continue to work for, with all islanders to ensure that we can do what we can for them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Belvedere. I don't know about you, Mr. Speaker, but 21 cents a day doesn't give me a great sense of, you know, feeling that somebody's got my back when it comes to helping me cover the cost of living. So perhaps there's some other things we could do, Mr. Speaker. The revenue collected by the province, primarily from income and corporate taxes, is how we fund essential programs and services. Government continuously underestimates its revenues, which means this government is underestimating its capacity to deliver services for islanders. Simply put, it means less services like health care. Question for the Minister of Finance. How are you reviewing and improving your tax projections so we aren't underspending on essential services for islanders? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We continue to, to, uh, to have a number of investments for islanders. Uh, the Honourable Member would, would be quite happy if we wouldn't have uh, lowered the tax rate for small business, if we wouldn't, if we wouldn't give uh, small businesses a break at all. And that is not the way we feel that we can grow the economy here in PEI. We need to bounce back from, from the COVID pandemic, and we will work with small business and with all islanders to make sure that we do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Perhaps the Minister has forgotten that the official opposition actually committed to a small business tax cut. In fact, she's mentioned it on the floor before. <laughs> And so that means, I guess, we're going to see the continuing underestimation of revenues. So, because you know, you worked the last three years, why not continue? Mm -hmm. PEI is one of only three jurisdictions which has less than five tax brackets. We have no higher income tax bracket at all, which means those who earn more than $100,000 a year, like every minister over there, pays the same as someone earning $65,000. New tax brackets are literally progressive. You only pay the higher tax on the earnings over the threshold. So the old story of punishing people for earning more money doesn't hold any water. It's actually fair and equitable for all islanders. And after all, that's what you say you care about. Question for the Minister of Finance. How much potential revenue is the provincial government leaving on the table by not adding that higher income tax bracket? Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Honorable Member, we do have for all intents and purposes, a fourth tax bracket. We have a sure tax for people that earn over $100,000. That has been in place for, for a number of years, is my understanding. And I will point out to the Honourable Member that you might say that you support small business, but the Honourable Member from uh, Mermaid Stratford stood up and said we could have done more money, or, or had better use of that money that we're saving, to, or saving small businesses. Mm -hmm. I tend to disagree. Uh, the government on this side of the House supports small business. We support all, all islanders, and mm we'll -hmm. continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was pleased to hear that one of the new medical hubs is established at the polyclinic, but I was shocked to hear that so far only two health professionals are involved in a building that already houses about 50 health professionals. Questions to the Minister of Health and Wellbeing. Have you met with the existing health professionals? at the polyclinic as a group and ask them what it would take for them to join your planned collaborative model. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the answer to the question, have I met with them at this point in time? No, I have not. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, the Status of Women Equality Report Card was published recently. While PEI was given a B-plus grade, 
there were many issues highlighted, and I quote, consensus is that we are at best halfway to gender equality in PEI, and we are not yet at the halfway mark for people living in low income or for groups labeled diverse because they're subject to systemic disadvantages and discrimination. The report states the goal is to have a balance between percentage of women workers and the percentage of women managers, but the report notes the average gap on this item is minus 14.1%. Uh, the public's uh, uh, question to the minister are responsible for the status of women. The Public Service Commission does not use talent management programming. Similar approaches with targeted staffing are becoming a model of choice, especially federally. Will you commit to championing a more progressive approach to closing the gender gap? The Honourable Minister for the Status of Women. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Since being appointed uh, in my role as Minister Responsible for the Status of Women, I have been uh, championing all women's issues and, and concerns. And Mr. Speaker, this is certainly um, certainly one whereby I, uh, I, I ensure that my colleagues um, understand my viewpoint on this, and, and I advocate on behalf of women in leadership. Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, the Public Service Commission, they've done a tremendous amount of work around um, diversity uh, in their recruitment efforts and, and training efforts, Mr. Speaker, but certainly there's, there's always work to be done, so I, I look forward to working with my colleague, the Minister of Finance, on uh, ensuring that we, we fill more of these roles with women. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. <clears throat> Another gap was um, support for social inclusion allowance for children whose caregivers on social assistance to participate with friends in community activities. So some examples might be art class or dance lessons. Questions to the minister. Uh, will your government reconsider and provide the funds to families on social assistance to ensure their children can participate with friends and peers in community activities? Double. Minister for the status of women? Yes, certainly. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this might this question might be better directed to one of my colleagues, but I'll I'll try to um, take it as best I can. Mr. Speaker, I uh, we recognize the importance of ensuring that our, our children are exposed to extracurriculars and, and sports, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Health, that was something that he had advocated for um, in his budget to ensure that the uh, amount um, directed to uh, kids sport PEI uh, was increased. So I was really happy to see that. Again, I think we all we all know. No, um, we need to get our kids active. We need to get them off their screens. So anything we can do to support that, Mr. Speaker, I'd be a strong advocate of. So I do appreciate the honourable member's question. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, and these questions could could go to various ministers, but I want to make sure that 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 you're championing it. And you know, it's not just kids sport because a lot of a lot of uh, kids don't play sports, so just look at that across the board. Another area needing assistance and commitment is the goal of gender parity in appointments of chairs and vice chairs to agencies, boards, and, and commissions. The, re the result reported over the last two years from June 2019 to Ju June 2021, government appointed 21 women and 27 men as chairs. Question to the same minister. Given this information, what actions will your government take to ensure parity appointments of chairs and vice chairs in the future? The Honorable Minister for the Status of Women. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and certainly um, in executive council, as we're, we're making those appointments, that's always something that's top of mind uh, in terms of our consideration. And, and uh, I'll be quite honest, if there's not, not enough um, names of women that come forward, it's something that we'll actually ask uh, it to go back out and, and to see if there's there's additional women that um, would, would consider applying for, for some of these roles. So, Mr. Speaker, again, it's top of mind for, for me as Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. It's top of mind for all of my colleagues. I think that we've uh, made some great strides in this direction, uh, Mr. Speaker, I even look at the more the most recent appointments around deputy ministers, and, and really we we hired uh, the the premier appointed a, a number of really really strong women candidates, which again is is wonderful. Um, but of course, we're going to continue uh, in the right direction, and um, I uh, I will endeavor to continue advocating uh, on on behalf of all women in leadership roles. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member from Pinkness, Pomerol, deputy speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The tourism season on PEI is fast approaching, and I, when I dare question the Minister of Tourism and Culture on uh, concerns that will be affecting the upcoming tourism season, I get accused of fear-mongering. But the facts do not lie, Mr. Speaker. Many island car rental businesses have voiced they have, all, they have already sold out for most of the summer as supply chain issues continues to affect this industry. 
This will have a negative impact on our ability to attract tourists, but also our ability to show them the beauty of the most rural areas of Prince Edward Island, as they will now be forced to stay central, centrally where public transit is available. And no, the rural transit program will not solve this. Question to the Minister of Tourism. Where are we at with the implementing of the service of a car sharing platform called Turo? Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good questions, Honourable Member. This is a concern uh, that we've been working on uh, over the past six months. I believe the announcement of uh, Turo went out uh, around uh, uh, lunchtime. If not, it's, uh, it's in the near future. Uh, we've got a working group uh, committed to, uh, to this, and uh, we're on the right path. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Dinesh Pomeroe. Mr. Speaker, Islanders who have looked into registering with the service have voiced that they, have, uh, they will have an increase through insurance costs due to the needing the additional supplementary coverage uh, that is not really worth it financially for some of them. There's also a concern on the amount of insurance companies that offer this coverage, forcing people to possibly cancel or change providers resulting in further fees. So question to the same minister. What is being done to address the issue of insurances yeah. associated with those wanting to register their personal vehicles on the Turo car sharing platform. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Members. So uh, the Department has been working on this with industry as a whole for the last six months. Uh, there's been great uptake, uh, great communication. Uh, this is a, a Canadian-wide issue right now with the rental cars. Even you look at all the car lots ac across PEI, Mr. Speaker, there's not a car in sight. So we believe this platform is uh, certainly going to help. I don't have any stats on the insurance side of it, but I'll certainly go back to the Department and see what they have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another threat to our tourism season here on Prince of Island is the news that Flair Airlines is currently under a license review from the Canadian Transportation Agency due to concerns about not meeting Canadian ownership requirements to fly in the country. The company is at risk for losing its ability to operate as early as May the 3rd, which could have devastating impacts on their new routes coming to PEI this summer. Question to the same minister. Have you been in contact with your federal counterparts regarding the CTA license review for Flair Airlines and what level of risk does this play on our 2022 tourism season? Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, Honourable Member. So myself personally, I haven't been in touch with the federal government, but I do know our department has been working with uh, Charlottetown Airport on this issue. Uh, we're really hoping this is going to get rectified uh, before the tourism season. We're expecting a big year, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're quite confident uh, it's going to be one. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Monaco, Kilmyard. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, recently, I've had a number of messages from, uh, well, students at Montague High, and I know that there's a couple of schools that have started uh, petitions that would like to see a normal graduation held this, uh, this summer. And I know they've had that robbed from them for the past couple of years, and I think with the uh, restrictions being lifted now, um, it would be nice to see them have a normal graduation. A question to the Education Minister, what are the plans for high school graduations this summer? Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. I, too, have been receiving lots of um, emails and, and phone calls uh, regarding this issue because, of course, our students want to have a, a very near normal graduation and prom. Mr. Speaker, I actually spoke with uh, the Director of the Public Schools Branch this morning, Norbert Carpenter, and uh, we discussed the latest at, as to where schools are at across the board. Uh, at this point, the majority of schools haven't yet determined exactly what they're planning on doing. They are working with their school communities um, and they're trying to find a positive solution for all, Mr. Speaker. I know that UPI is, uh, has indicated that they'd be open um, to, to hosting some of the graduations and of course they have that additional space. But I think, again, we, they, haven't, they haven't yet determined the details and, and I'm happy to give an update whenever, whenever that's been confirmed. So thank you very much, Mr. Monica Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, but I do feel that after two years of restrictions, and understandably so, that if restrictions are lifted, it would be nice to see them to be able to have a normal graduation, as they have in the past for years before without any issue. Um, minister, I don't know if this is within your authority as minister or not, and obviously you want to respect the officials in the schools, but can do you have the authority to step in to say that Let's try and give our kids, grade 12 kids, students, a normal graduation this year, like it was before the pandemic. 
Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think that that has been my message. Um, I am encouraging schools to, to try to coordinate something that's as near normal as possible. Mr. Speaker, again, recognizing um, that each of them may decide to carry out for various reasons. Smaller smaller graduations. I've heard from some students where, who are in a school where they are having smaller graduations. And as a result, that means they can invite lots more guests. And they're really happy about that. So Mr. Speaker, I think that the school uh, administration, uh, teachers, they need to work with our, their school communities and come up with these more positive uh, conclusions for all, but I am I'm happy to hear that plans are underway, and I think that there's going to be a real successful prom and graduation across the board this year. Thank Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I know the Premier mentioned this in his greetings, and uh, all the members of the House may have seen uh, the uh, the newest uh, the newest build here in Charlottetown. Uh, it is the uh, supportive and affordable housing that CMHA is uh, putting up on Fitzroy Street. Um, it's very fascinating. I find it very intriguing, Mr. Speaker, as such an innovative and a modular build. Uh, my question today is to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. What part did your department play specifically in this development? Deputy Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to rise to speak to this. Uh, I was going to mention it in my greetings, but I sort of ran out of time today, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Anyhow, the, uh, no. the rapid housing uh, initiative um, is really an important one, and it's the, the federal government can really come to the table with this. And, and in round one, we actually partnered with the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association uh, to submit, put in a submission. Um, they decided, the federal government decided to focus on Indigenous initiatives in round one of the, the RHI. And so in round two, that's what we finally got to announce yesterday is the funding there and so uh, the department was happy a year ago one of my first announcements as minister to uh, put two million dollars towards this initiative thank you member from Charlottetown uh, thank you uh, mr. speaker so my understanding on this uh, is that it's the modular components and it's almost built like a you know pardon the phrase but like a Lego set um, now that apparently the modular unit part of it is the the hardest to get done and the most time-consuming and from my, what my understanding of this is mr. speaker is that they actually come from Alberta so my question to the same minister um, has there been any look into maybe trying to secure these modular style of homes maybe closer to home the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and indeed, it is extremely exciting, and the opportunities that this sort of modular housing presents is, is great. Um, as you mentioned, the even 720 Solutions that supplies them talks about them as 12 foot by 60 foot uh, Legos. But uh, as the member uh, uh, says, Mr. Speaker, the company, although uh, headquartered in Alberta, these these particular units were built, uh, I believe, by Kent in New Brunswick and then brought over. And in, in fact, because they have to be shipped there, they're actually built the higher specs because they have to be more rigid because they're completely finished inside, Mr. Speaker. Drywall, vanities, the whole works. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are having discussions, uh, and myself with my other ca uh, colleagues, to see what we could do to build those sort of things on PEI. Thank you. Charlottetown Winslow. Put my last question, but anyway, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So again, you know, the, the, the main thing that I was so impressed by, again, living in Charlottetown, and you know, you see the cranes up, and you're like, I wonder what that's all about. But it, it is amazing how quickly that these did go up. And it may be more of a statement or a question to the minister, like how quickly that these can go up. It would be great to see this maybe even in some other parts of the province. And of course, I'm going to ask if you are looking at any other parts of PEI or even a little further north in Charlottetown. Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and it's no secret that the lead time to building housing is, is one of the biggest challenges that we face, Mr. Speaker. And uh, with this particular uh, housing, the key thing is the planning, which, which typically takes about a, a year to do. And then from the time the, uh, the button is pressed to say start building to the time people can move in is, is about six months. But the really nice thing is that the, the costs are, are very fixed and very predictable. So you know from beginning then you're not going to see the cost overruns that we see in a lot of our housing projects. So, Mr. Speaker, there's so many positives with this. And to actually see one in place on the island, uh, of course, uh, there's many opportunities to use that in different places across the island, but in particular places where the cost of land is high and we need uh, high density housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Valerie Sherbrooke. Over the years, processes to assess injured workers and determine claims have been improved in many ways, such as, and, and I can barely even say this, ending the use of the meat chart approach 
to determining benefit amounts, and most recently amendments to the Workers' Compensation Act last sitting to index benefits at 100% cost of living increases. However, there seems to be very little consideration of those who were injured previously and are forced to live with the consequences of past faulty processes. Minister, what is being done to identify injured workers who are still living with the consequences of past Workers' Compensation Board processes and may not be able to meet their basic needs as a result? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm not sure uh, what the Honourable Member means by, uh, uh, I guess, the, the past and, and, and what took place there. From, from what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, there, there's a process, and, uh, and uh, there's an appeal process and another appeal process. So at any given time, if a worker's not happy uh, with a ruling, Mr. Speaker, uh, they, they are assigned a, a representative to, uh, to help them guide through and, and do an appeal. So without having all the detail of what the Honourable Member speak can do, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure. Thank you. Time for Alan Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as processes are changed, there's no going back to see if past decisions that were made are really putting workers in a position now where they have enough to meet their basic needs. So that's what I'm talking about. In response to my written question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing, we learned that there are 18 clients from social programs who receive workers' compensation, which is reflected as income. Perhaps that doesn't seem like many, but these are 18 islanders, real people, who were injured on the job, who we know are not able to meet their basic needs, and they need to seek additional support from the province despite receiving workers' compensation benefits. Question to the Minister, does this seem acceptable to you? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Honourable Member, for the question. So, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with those 18 claims. Uh, I don't know what they're going through, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I'm want to make sure that people are living um, and enough money is going in. Obviously, we see inflation, what is taking place. Um, I can certainly go back and ask the department what we are doing. I'm glad to see social development housing are helping out. Um, but if, if it's not enough, we need to look at it, Mr. Speaker, and I'm prepared to go back and take a look. Thank you. Time to Alice Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, during a recent standing committee presentation, representatives from the Workers' Compensation Board shared that there are approximately 850 extended claimants, Islanders injured at work, who year after year have been losing ground as their benefits have not been indexed fully to reflect the cost of living. Low-income workers and those who have lived with their injuries the longest are hardest hit. Minister, it's good to hear you're going to go back after today to find out more about what, what could be done, but this is not a new issue. We've brought this up several times in the House already. So I need to know clearly what is going to be done to ensure that all injured workers, all injured workers on PEI can live with basic health and dignity. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I believe what took place uh, happened back in 1993 where a different policy was put in. So past previous uh, 1993, um, anybody that was on WCB at the time had uh, had taken, and I believe they, they possibly had a choice, but to have taken a, a payout that was actually more at the time. Uh, so I believe this is some of the, the, the issues that it has taken place. Uh, I've had a couple calls similar, uh, Mr. Speaker. So. Um, what we can't do, we can't go back in time and uh, and uh, change change an offer that was already given. But, Mr. Speaker, I can go back and make sure. We want to make sure everybody is living uh, with enough money. We want to make sure that there's enough food on the table. We want to make sure that they're going to be able to uh, afford fuel. So without talking and, and knowing these individual cases, Mr. Speaker, all I can do at this point is go back and talk to my department and, and get a better uh, handle of what's taking place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford, final question. Mr. Speaker, rural municip municipalities across this province are working hard to stay on track to meet their obligations, to stay compliant comply with the implementation of the Municipal Government Act. The next phase is for each municipality to have a lo an official land use plan. The community of Alexandra is in a special planning area. There have been concerns on how the recommendations in the Land Matters PEI report will impact special planning areas. So question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Have you discussed with the Minister of Agriculture culture and land, how the delay in the Planning Act amendments will impact rural municipalities as they develop their official plans? And if so, when can rural municipalities expect to hear on how these changes will impact them directly? The Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our department has been working with the uh, 
Minister of Lands, Department of Agriculture on the special planning areas and also on the land matters report. And we have advised some uh, municipalities that, uh, that we are looking at the practice and how the, this will go forward. And that if they, you know, they, they wish not to uh, move forward on putting, um, you know, a planning session in place for them as it deals with land and want to wait, that's fine. But we're working with our municipalities and also the other department to ensure that we we come up with the best solution for island municipalities as they move forward. Thank you. End of question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table answer to questions taken as notice, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Social Development and Housing, that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Yeah. Yeah. Any more tabling of documents? The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, by command of her honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the 2019-2020 Teachers Superannuation Fund Annual Report for the period ending June 30th, 2020, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Carry. Anyone else? Okay, honourable members, uh, honourable members, pursuant to section 16 of the Audit Act, I wish to advise that I received the Atlantic Provinces joint follow-up recommendations to the Atlantic Lottery Cooperation report from the Auditor General. I move that the report be received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Honourable Clerk. Okay. Reports by committees, introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself into committee the whole House to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, to chair the committee of the whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House taking into consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger up to the floor. Shall it be granted? Granted. All our members, we left off on page 69, the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Just please state your name and position for Hansard. Bulger, Director of Finance for Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon. <coughs> so again, page 69, Department of Environment, Energy, Climate Action. Field services, appropriations <coughs> provided for the suitable management of public land and financial and technical assistance to private woodlot owners. Administration, 31,700. Equipment, 9,600. Material supplies and services, 218,300. Professional services, 200. Salaries, 2,357,400. Travel and training, 180,800. Grants, 1,174,000. Total field services, 3,972,000. Okay. Who whistled? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll go with Charlottetown Belvedere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Forest Enhancement Program, it's a $655,000 program. It's probably one of the significant parts of the grant piece in here. Um, it, can you just speak to sort of the, how, that's work, how that's working and whether that's changing? I know are there more or less people applying and what's kind of happening with that as it stands currently? Um, yes, well, we do have $150,000 additional allocated in the 22-23 budget. Um, there were 102 management plans in 21-22, um, 26 hectares of commercial thinning, 26 pre-commercial thinning, um, $427,000 seedlings, and uh, 271 <coughs> manual plantation maintenance. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. So um, did, are you seeing a trend of, of the, obviously you're expanding the program with that additional funding and that kind of increase, is that kind of a pretty consistent trend or has there been a bump given some of the more focus in, in program delivery in the department? It, it's to um, catch the program up to the, to the costs, the reality of the costs for um, operating the program and for the contractors. Okay. Charlottetown Belvedere. Where was that cost being covered before? Was that being covered by, by in the field? It, it would have been, yes. Right. Charlottetown Belvedere. So are you hoping that with that additional investment you're going to see sort of a better uptake as a result of the reduction in barrier to entry? I believe so, yes. Charlottetown Belvedere. So I'm hoping that next year we'll be able to hear sort of what that looks like and whether we're seeing that increase. <laughs> yes. And, okay, that would be great. Um, you know, when, uh, Chair, it's a general question, but it does relate to the section as well, I know you've spoken very much about the shift from it for into program delivery. Um, ha, is part of the overall plan, we hadn't mentioned that there was an overall plan, but is there a hope that you are going to be able to track, you know, as you're making these shifts and changes, that you track benchmarks, sort of where, we're, where are we, where are we going with that, and are we seeing that return on the investment of time and, and you know, human capital and all the other pieces? Yes, yes. Charlottetown Belvedere. And is there any intention to report on that? You know, I mean, I know you don't have like a, a report. They're, they're, they're all a little piece. There's lots of different pieces, but is there going to be any way that we're going to be able to sort of see that on a on a broader basis? Like, or are we still going to need to look for it sort of section by section going forward? I think to align um, to bring the programs under the Department of Environment, we will in the coming year start to see we'll have a full year of of a budget and we'll be able to bring back a report that speaks to the, the new investments and also the, um, the human resources have gone into those and we can bring something back with us next year in 23-24. Yeah. <clears throat> Charlottetown Belvedere. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, thank you, Chair, for your indulgence, because I think that's, it's not something we'd expect to see right now, but I guess sort of, you know, signaling intent that we would hope to see that coming forward and that uh, that is, you know, from this point you've got benchmarks and then we can see that as a, as a future outcome. Um, if I can go back to the, the budget line item, the, the low carbon economy fund is 265000 Could you just explain what that's 
That for? is uh, that's for plantation. Okay. Um, so that's the federal dollars for um, plantation. Okay. Yeah. Sure, with that Belvedere. Is that one hundred percent in a federal through? It's about 50 50 50, 50. Yes. Charlottetown Belvedere. So does that re represent the federal contribution or the entire contribution? That would be, that would be, let me just think about this. <laughs> that would be the expenditure side, so we get 50% of that from revenue. Okay. Yep. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. I, I appreciate the clarification. Is that fund an ongoing one or is that, that coming to an end? I know there was something that was finishing soon, but yes, that was um, finishing. Sorry. Yes, 22-23 is the final year for the current version, and we expect that Potentially, there will be a renewal. Charlotte okay. Belvedere. No, thank you. That, that's. Um, I mean, obviously, it's been the grand scheme of things, but it's still it's a hundred and the chunk of money that we we get that can really help move those targets forward. So it'd be good to see that continuing. Um, can you give us a breakdown at all of how much public and private land is managed under this section, and how much of that might be under the forest enhancement plan that you mentioned earlier? I don't have the breakdown with me, okay. but I can bring that back. <clears throat> I, would, I, would, I would appreciate that again. Charlotte sure, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, again, it gives us context for the expenditure and how it relates. I know that one of the really successful you know, programs, I think of things like the Winter Woodlot Tour, you know, as a education outreach. Um, are there any other activities that we do to sort of get to a, a target to bring land in under the forest enhancement, or sorry, the forest management plans? Because I know there's, there's a lot of existing woodlots, but sort of how do you how do you get out there and what are you trying to achieve? Is it to increase the amount of acreage or what? I can bring back from the division what the their objectives are. Mm. <clears throat> Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Just to sort of again try and get some alignment on the connecting the expenditure. I just have one yep. more in this section. Okay. Then you could if you could, yeah. Um, I guess my question to that, the reason why I really like to see that take back is just, you know, with the investment is significant. So if you don't, if we don't have kind of a target of like how much land do we have, how much land are we trying to measure, it's kind of really difficult to look at the assessment of that investment. You know, I know that the, the word on the street is it's a really good and effective program, especially if you're kind of reducing that barrier to entry cost, but it would be really helpful to sort of get some of that context. I'm, I'm good for now, Chair. Thank you. O'Leary and Vernance. Uh, Mr. I I'd had the opportunity to drop into the uh, forestry office, I usually do once a year at least to get my burning permits, and there's more signs there at the entrance of the doorway, non-admittance, not open to the public, things like that. Is there any sense of when that's going to be open to the general public? Uh, I actually don't, but I can, I can find out for you. I mean, a number of our staff had, had to ship to work from home, but that wouldn't necessarily be the case out in, in that area, but I'll find out for you. Oh, are we in Vernes? Yeah, because uh, I, mean, I was fortunate enough that uh, I arrived just on my way home from the legislature and uh, on Friday and uh, happened to get a guy just leaving at the time, you know, their, their day was done. And I did get my building or my <coughs> burning permit, which was very much appreciated. But it is a bit of a process, so it's sometimes hard to do. I know you can do with them at the access centers and stuff, but uh, I would say that we're probably at a point in time that those facilities should be open to the public. And uh, so I would encourage you to make that call and let's get back to normal on, on that particular uh, uh, site. Uh, another question I have is that I've right raised in the legislature a bit with the Minister of Agriculture and Land and probably Highways. What could the Department of Forestry do with an additional 1,568 acres? And you know where I'm coming from. It's the indexed fields from the potato ward. And uh, has your department had any thoughts on uh, if that ever did happen, uh, what you could do with it? And I'm sure there will be a debate between you and the Minister of Agriculture on the pasture side of it, but... Uh. Yeah, well, we've certainly discussed it, but I mean, you know, obviously for us, we're trying to build our, our inventory, particularly of land that can sequester carbon, so uh, forestry would be important to us in any capacity, so yeah. Forest, we, we know that we have to expand our, our forestry and we know we have to land, extend our land holdings because our target is now 10%. Olary and Vernesse. So that would sort of sound like a, a potential opportunity then for your department and might solve a lot of problems for uh, a number of departments and an industry if uh, that land was taken out of production and other usages other than agriculture could be, uh, could be developed. Uh, sure, I might put solar on it too. 
Yeah, yeah well, well, I mean, yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm, I'm encouraged that you have a creative mind and you're thinking about opportunities that could exist should that ever happen. Sure. Uh, my next question, Chair, if you're... Yeah. Okay, is uh, on, uh, I brought it up a few times. I've had some debates with a previous minister on this regarding, uh, you know, Hurricane Doran did a lot of damage, not only uh, public land, but private land. And, and, uh, and, I, and I really appreciate the uh, potential of a new uh, forestry fighting uh, truck coming to the West Point area. But in that Glenwood area, <laughs> we've seen a lot of trees get blown out. And I'm not sure when that truck is going to arrive, but in the end of the day, if, if a fire broke out before that, uh, that 1972 Ford may not be able to uh, serve the purposes. But is there any plans of cleaning up more of those uh, properties that uh, were blown out by Dorian? I, I know there has been some work done, but uh, maybe you can give me an update on, on how much more is required for the, by the department. Yeah, and I guess uh, in all in all lands, and it goes back to the, you know, the sustainable management plans for forestry you know to be able to create a product for that wood that's basically lying there I think is important and uh, you know those are some of the things that we are looking at is you know, is there a biochar opportunity or is there an opportunity to, to chip that wall clean in the forest in a way that the you know the younger trees can grow grow up through so I would say yes but I I mean I don't know what the timeline of that would be because we have to develop a product. So I, can we do it quick enough for this? I don't know, but I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. O'Leary and Vernesse? I'll give you just a little update of my own situation. So my own property had a quite a bit of uh, blowouts. And uh, I've been trying to get a contractor to come and do something with that. Uh, they're, they're all pretty busy is, is one issue. Uh, the second issue is, is that when you're talking smaller volumes, so if I'm going to say five acres or something along that line or ten acres, whatever it might be, it, it, you basically get set up, we'll put you on a list and we'll try to get to you whenever we can. And, uh, you know, so now I'm looking at a couple of years later still, and I'm, I was to see my local contractor uh, on the weekend, you know, where am I at in that list? And it's been a couple of years now, and he keeps saying it's coming, but the price of wood's going up and down. And sometimes the situation occurs where that it, it doesn't encourage me to go to, to the, get that poor quality wood, just to take my time and my crew and all those kinds of things. So ha is there any potential of an incentive or something to, uh, to try to encourage uh, those smaller little portions to make it more viable for, for these contractors to try to clean that up? Because I, I am fearful, even on my own property, about that potential lightning strike because it's tinder dry on these sections that have blown down. And I've had a go at trying to do it with a chainsaw and myself. It's a tangled mess. It's really difficult to try to deal with it. So uh, I'm just trying to wonder what your thoughts are. And has that been brought to your attention? No, but I mean, I would definitely be, I wouldn't run away from having that conversation for sure I think I'd I would entertain any good ideas so you know how would it work and where would we find the people to do the work and this or not I think those would be issues that we have too yeah but uh, that's not to say we shouldn't tackle it because the other side of it is it's sitting there it's, it's emitting carbon anyways it's breaking down it's not serving the purpose that we'd like to have it serve and in many ways it, it could be inhibiting the forest from growing at the rate that it that it could as well, and that new growth may be stunted by not having the area to grow there. So, uh, I would say, yeah, well, let's have a look at it and see if we can come up with something. Okay. Well, are you have you had a discussion with the PEI Woodlot Association around that, or I mean, that's just another comment to make that if uh, that PEI Woodlot Association and maybe yourself could get together. But I, I would, I would think that the solution is probably something to at least incentivize uh, these contractors uh, to uh, put their, make a choice if, if it, the choice is. Uh, you know, cutting a better stand, this would encourage them to cut a, a weaker stand or a, a section that has been blown out. And like I say, it's not as cost effective. I totally get that. And I've even offered to my my contractor to say, I'd, you know, I'd be willing to pay some difference to try to encourage you to come and do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, just say just with the price of fuel and all these things have gone up, the viability is hard to find there. And uh, I just think that's a factor that that is, is inhibiting this work from being done. So uh, I guess I'll just encourage you. I don't need to ask a question, but I encourage you to maybe have a conversation with the Woodlot Association uh, and try to see what we can do to deal with this issue. Because it is concerning if a fire broke out. Plus, you see, all of the items that you mentioned, uh, it, it only seems to be a negative if we don't get that cleaned up to a certain degree. So yeah. thanks, uh, Chair. Great. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. 
Um, uh, would the carbon capture tree planting program be under this section? Yes, it is. Yes. Perfect. Mermaid Stratford. So I had the great pleasure of actually witnessing some of those tree planters last summer who are super fast in planting trees and, you know, just kind of whiz right through. And it's an excellent program to take that marginal land and reforest it. So I have a couple questions on it. Um, first question is, is it seems like it's all white spruce that we're putting in. Is there any plan to make it a more diverse, uh, a broader diversity of trees instead of just the uh, mono planting? Oh, no, that. Yeah. We'll bring that back for you, yes. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I would strongly recommend looking at how we can put diversity in there because, I mean, just doing a tree stand of white spruce obviously isn't how we'd find a forest. So if we are trying to replant a forest um, to capture carbon, there's probably better ways to uh, create more diversity there. My second question is around the actual um, planters. And my understanding is these are contract, it's a contract, we have somebody out there contracting it. When is the last time that we've reviewed how much we pay them to um, plant per tree? Because I'm wondering if it's sustainable to plant this many trees. I guess another question is how many are we planning to uh, do, but do we have enough um, human resources to be able to keep up to this program? Um, I'll check in with the division and bring that back. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. And do you have, so do you have a report on how many people actually um, applied and were approved and planted the trees last year? Well, I mean, something, wouldn't we? We have 102 management plans okay. under the Force Enhancement Program. Um, I can check on the on the carbon capture tree planting. Okay. For you? Yep. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Because my understanding is you need over a hectare of land, of land in order to be able to qualify for it. So, I mean, it, and it's an excellent opportunity. It's high slope fields, it's marginal lands, it's around the watershed area. So I'm wondering how many people applied for the program. Was anybody turned down? And I believe it's in the vicinity of 8,500 trees per planting, which is substantial. Um, and again, it's, it's a good program. I've seen them go in, what they do, and then they manage the, the trees as they get to uh, maturity level. So. Uh, I'd be interested in a lot more detail around that because um, I think it's a really good opportunity to get some land replanted um, if the uh, landowners are eager to do it. I'd hate to see us turn anybody away. So with that, I'm, I'm good. Thanks, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. 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 Resource inventory and modeling. Appropriations provided for the collection, analysis, and interpretation of land use inventory information and trends. Administration 7,000, equipment 10,000, material supplies and services 10,900, professional services 7,500, salaries 559,700, travel and training 16,500, total resource inventory and modeling 611,600. Charlotte Humble over there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, State of the Forest report, when are we expecting that to be completed? I believe it's going to be completed in the fall. Of this year? In the fall of this year, yes. Cheryl, time over there. Okay, because the, the 2010, I know it's every decade, the 2010 State of the Forest Report wasn't released until December 2013. And it looks like, so now it's two years for this one. Is, is that, why does it take so long for these to come through when they're due and then they should, they're not like two, two or three years later? What's the reason for the big gap? I wouldn't want to speculate. I believe I know that currently they're still doing the interpretation of the area photos. Um, the contractor is finalizing that piece. Um, and we're also doing um, the enhanced forest in, uh, inventory. So there's a, additional components that are being completed. Um, so I, I guess it, it just takes some time to, to do the photography and do the interpretation of those. Charles, I'm Belvedere. Is there anything we can do to help speed it up? Like, is it, is it a funding? Is it a funding question? No, it's not. No, I, no, I wish no. it was. I wish no. it was. Yes. I know. I know. You've, I know. We've spoken about it before, yes. and on that delay, and I know, like, you did have preliminary information that you would share, yeah, which well, was we got well in advance. Right? We got the pictures. Yeah. So we knew by the pictures, just anecdotally. Okay. Apparently, it takes a lot longer than that to get a report. 
So, Charlottetown Belvedere. Maybe we need to change the dates then on them because it's <laughs> right. like when you're when you're two years out, like it's 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 a big gap. Look, right? I don't disagree with you, and I think we talked about it on Friday that if we're if we're going to set targets for ourselves for net zero, and we're going to be aggressive. We're going to have to measure more than every ten years. Yeah. Charlottetown Especially Belvedere. So, so you preempted my next question, which was, you know, I, I, I'll be really clear, Ted, like a once in a decade isn't enough. No. Um, I mean, we, when, when we're dealing with things that already take 10, 20, 30 years to even get to the point where they, we can begin to measure value or longer, you know, then, yeah, like we can't accurately work with that in terms of the investment that's needed if we don't have more up-to-date data. And if that data is not only 10 years late, 10 years, only 10 years at a time, but it's also then two years late, it's just, it just doesn't align with the targets that we've got in every other space. No, I agree with you 100%. And I think that every 10 years when you when you get what, when we don't have the report back, but we know what the LIDAR shows and, yeah. and we have carbon capture goals that we want to use the forest for, and all of a sudden we're like, uh oh that's not going to work because they're not there anymore. Yeah. It's a, it's really hard just to turn every 10 years to try to cut the wheel yeah. and go in a different direction. So you're right. Charles on Belvedere? Well, you don't want to use the analogy with the, t the Titanic, right? But like it takes it takes a long time to turn something that <laughs> We're big, scraping so. up against some stumps. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I know I've done some work on another project ages ago that looked at like that used LIDAR as well. And, and there was a lot of work that was happening around um, the coordination with LIDAR because obviously there are huge volumes of data um, and AI to be able to sort of speed up that interpretation and analysis. I'm just, I, 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 it's very cutting edge, but then again, those things are moving faster and faster. You know, is there any other jurisdictions that are sort of running across some issues that we could look at that, that have been able, could be able to help? Uh, I don't know that the, if there is, but there's a lot of emerging technology mm -hmm. and we're, getting, we're, we're hearing from a lot of people that are saying, hey, can we have a look at your climate goals and can we do some... Um, satellite type stuff to, to measure those things. So those are one of the things that we measure. So I think, I think, you know, with the rest of the world, and along with us trying to make this shift and set uh, our targets so strongly, that there will be all this great mer emerging technology that will come and say, I can now provide you with this. So, which could be real time. Yeah. We could say, we could say year to year what our changes are in our coastline and in a lot of different areas like how our temperature match with our coastline change and our forestry change and the good the bad and the ugly kind of thing but yeah i think that just anecdotally because i'm hearing from companies mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of people out there trying to jump in that space yeah. really quickly sure i'm belvedere one of the really exciting spaces around that is the alignment then with clean tech and with our climate leadership space right so so when you have a huge volume of data it's always interesting to people that want to kind of, sort of say what else could we use that data for um, that could help us learn things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. And PEI is unique in that we actually can map the entire province as a jurisdiction. There are very few jurisdictions that have that capacity and then align it with a lot of the other amazing data that we have. So, you know, it would be really interesting, you know, to have that conversation about what happens if we make that data open data. What happens then if we have that available through, the, you know, the, the, the link of the clean tech space and the, the Climate Leadership Institute in terms of saying, okay, have at it. What, like, what can we learn from this? How can we use this? When we're thinking about adaptation plans, we're thinking about planting, you know, to my colleague's question about um, diversity and, and effect. Like, you can actually measure with that kind of data the heat output and the carbon sink from different, different um, plantation, from different forest projects on a per hectare basis, on a year to year or in a, on, a, on a cycle basis. So there's some really neat things around that and it's very nerdy and I get very excited about it. But um, I think a lot of it is that, that key to that is accelerating the quality and the access to the data. So because one, once every decade isn't gonna cut it as, and I think we're at the same space on that. And I mean, we're looking for, we're looking to try to create partnerships out there where we, I'd like to be able to get as much baseline information as we have and as we work towards our goals and become successful be able to measure all different outcomes like not just our environmental outcomes mm. because those are going to be the probably the easiest to measure but to, we want to make sure we don't leave anybody behind we don't want we you know i i'm, I'm a big fan of like the donut economics mentality where mm. we where we make the change and we bring everybody along to, together. Yeah. Well, I think we could do it because we're small and jurisdictions that we're are... We're the right jurisdiction to do that. Right, we are. Yeah. But, but, but then we have like a powerful tool that we can share with other people in the world. If we can have all that data, we can say, well, here's what happened to us when we move these levers around and maybe you can avoid mistakes that we make or maybe you can avoid making mistakes by following our path because we were right. So, you know, and I think that's part of what our Clean Tech Partnership 
is, and and I mean, we have a lot of interest. It's there's a lot of people coming saying a lot of things, and it's you know, we have to get ourselves set and ready to start accepting them so that we can uh, take advantage of them, not just for us but for everybody. Yep. Charles on Belvedere. Thank you, and I'm not sure where the investment for that will come. It may be something that we see later on in like the climate secretariat space or in the net zero space, and I can ask you about it when we get there. But but I but. I think you're, it's one of those spaces of looking at, at um, looking at things from a different angle. Is is where we have an attract, we're an attractive space because of the physical properties. People come for tourism or for beaches or whatever. We can also be an attractive space um, because of the access we provide to the information that we have. And, and so when we talk about stuff like clean tech and the opportunity that sits in that area for innovation and leapfrogging across, the more open we are with that and the more open-minded we are to that, the more likely we're going to see some of that leapfrog outcome happen. That's, I, I think, I'm preaching I, to the choir. I'm, really excited. <laughs> I'm excited about it. And yeah. There's so many things that are happening that if they come through, you know, it's going to be really, it's an exciting time for us, I think, that as this, these things start falling in place. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you. Um, <coughs> One of the other pieces around this was land use, and I know, like when I first moved back here from to the UK, we had a map on the wall or a photograph on the wall that was an aerial, and it was from like 1973, and it was an aerial of our land. Um, so you could and you could see the lot lines and the, the houses and everything on it. And I still think about that as being sort of how impactful that is. You'd be able to see your own space. So the land use is also in this this one, and and sort of how do we um, how is is land use and 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 land planning and all that and connect into the net zero plan that we have in terms of resource inventory and modeling. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of our net zero stuff is is kind of quarterback right out of the net zero fob. I wouldn't have that. Okay. I wouldn't have enough information on that at this point to be able to, I can get it for you, but it's yeah. not in my head, I guess. Sure, I'm Belvedere. Thank you. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of, you know, obviously the Department of Agriculture and Land is doing that provincial land use policy. Yeah. But as you just mentioned, it can't sit in isolation from net zero goals and, and land use planning, including mitigation, all those other things are going to be part of that story too. So it's just wondering what the crossover, like where are we at the crossover of that? Well, from a, from a net zero perspective, well, yeah, we're, we're trying to draw it all together right now. Like we're, we really had a team, you know, kind of uh, spider web out into the, into the departments to, to work on and we're also doing the adaptation part that's I think you know at least half if not more of the of what the effort <laughs> needs to be um, and and that's that process that process is underway mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, like I said it's about how do we me measure all of the outcomes but how do we m make sure that it's understood that the healthcare system is an important part of this and that the social uh, service system is a huge part of it that kind of all of the pieces of government need to be a, a, a piece of this because it's it's not just about the environmental impacts it's about all of the things happening at the same time which will give us our GHG results but if we're really good when we do a really good job which I hope we, we do we will we'll change a lot of other outcomes at the same time well there's a, there, should, there could be a lot of positive outcomes that come along with it and that's so this is just one one part and we have to it does have to interlock so mm. and you know when you talk about the, the slope and the buffer zone buyback and the protection and like we really have to be clever and I mean the, the folks at agriculture are having great to to work with and they're really invested in the project with, which is great and the industry people are as well and I think there's a real opportunity to I think farmers are probably the most innovative so Give them a chance to innovate and, and be a good partner and then kind of stand back, back and watch. So it's all kind of coming coming together. We have really good staff. I I couldn't take credit for it, but <laughs> we have really good people out there making them, making the vision kind of come to life by making relationships and having those conversations. Charles on Belvedere. Thank you. We saw a lot of those projects last summer when we went on the various road trips and tours around, you know, for the watershed and, and for looking at deep water well impacts and stuff. We actually got to talk to a lot of the farmers that were doing some of those amazing yeah, projects yeah. And, and seeing that link. And there's, you know, there's definitely this kind of, you know, my colleague, the hockey stick thing happening in terms of sort of uh, some of what looks like a tip point. Um, but the, you know, one of the things we talked about here is about how there are more things coming under the umbrella in terms of direct project delivery and program delivery in your department. Yeah. One of the recommendations from the Land Matters report was recommendation of, to merge planning offices in agriculture and land and municipal affairs. 
would there also be, it, should that happen, which is a really good recommendation, would that also include staff from your department? Oh yeah, because we would have staff that, though, part of, that are part of the process, so. Yeah. But I couldn't, I don't, I wouldn't be able to say what it would look like, but yeah. Charles on Belvedere. You're not going to commit to a timeline on that then? <laughs> the interdepartmental stuff moves slower than this, the, the departmental stuff. Charles on Belvedere. A bit more like molasses, right? Yes. Um, so just back to the State of the Forest report. Obviously, you know, we're saying we're going to get this one this year, but, but aware that we need to move things. Do you have any kind of idea how or when we're going to be able to start? Like, like a commitment to sort of say, look, we're going to try and do these every two years or every five years or something? Is that something that's really on your radar right now that you could sort of say, please speak to? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what I'd like is to, to be able to have real-time tracking. Right, okay. And I think that we're working towards that. So, you know, if I'd like to be able to put out an RFP and see who's out there knocking, that, that they're not, you know, they're knocking on the doors, but are they willing to put pen to paper and yeah. commit to doing things for us? And I think that's going to be the, the stage. So if we had that, uh, like, we, we should be able to do real-time real analytics on everything in government. We really should. There, the data is everywhere, yeah. and then the data pieces all exist. But if we, we, we real-time tracked it, we could be measuring all of the outcomes all of the time yep. and make decisions based on that. Charles on Belvedere. Well, and that's, that's the, the gold standard for, for um, outcome-based decision-making. And, you know, it's sort of like a real-time dashboard, which is I know we've, we've looked at sort of other jurisdictions or, or we're trying to move towards that from, from different aspects of program delivery, but certainly a real-time dashboard in terms of sort of climate outcomes. When we, when we are now down to counting in years and not decades anymore, that actually makes it an enormous amount of sense. And what also then makes amount of sense is that we would need to be ready here to pivot because we're not going to be waiting years for the next program to roll out. So it's also about, you know, on a, on a, like you said, the departmental change is large because you're talking about really changing how fast we have to be able to move. Um, Okay, I'm gonna. I'll leave that there. For now, you've got other people on your list, Chair. Charlotte Ann Brighton. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a member next to me, um, I'm really interested in data too. Uh, it's absolutely critical to know where you are before you can plan where you're going. I was wondering, what kind of resolution do you get in the aerial surveys you're making? Can you? Can you just tell us woods there and fields there, or, or do you? Um, what do you learn from them? Well, so so, what we have is I just reading off here is complete lidar data with the digital area uh, imagery and ortho map all blended together. So I think there's pretty detailed what they can what they can see. I haven't looked at them myself, but uh, I think they're pretty detailed. Sure, on Brighton. Is there a chance you can bring back what you can actually the kind of what sure. you actually can read, like can you read, for instance, uh, how much carbon is stored, or the value of the lumber, I'll, give you, I'll bring you a sample of that sort of thing. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the sure. other point was, and I, I might have asked you this question already, but how does this, how does your survey uh, um, interact with the surveys done by or maintained by the climate lab, and how do you avoid counting the same trees twice if you're short of staff counting them are you planning it to get together to do something yeah well yeah we would have staff kind of work together all, all of the all of the time but uh, I think the this is something like we had talked about that had it been kind of like a government led initiative over a number of years we, we kind of do it every every 10 years so yeah I think that when I talk about like a real-time tool or or a tool that can give us more leading type um, data, I think we would look at, I think we would, a partnership with UPI, for example, is a great partnership because they could use it to analyze for different reasons and we might be using it, for, you know, in a, an internal versus a research type environment. I think it's good blend. Charles on Brighton. I guess I was hoping that you wouldn't do the same work twice. So are you saying that like your data that you collect, for instance, will be passed on to their database, so to, there's a, that kind of cooperation I don't know how happening. That part works, but ours will all be public, so yeah. yeah. Charlotte Town Brighton? Okay, I'm good, yeah. Charlotte Town Belvedere?
have any other... Sorry, just give me one moment, please. I've just lost my place where I'm at. Trend analysis. That's what I was going to ask about. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> just, I, I mentioned it briefly about um, the mapping and collecting of data and so on, but also PEI is a unique jurisdiction, but that doesn't mean that there are things we can't learn from other jurisdictions. What, how, do we, how do we connect with other, other jurisdictions in terms of um, what we do with our, with our modeling in particular? Like, is that something that, that is on the radar, or is that, yeah, I would expect that silly question. Yeah, so yeah, it's how do we, we all come together and make a bigger, bigger picture, but you know, when it comes to Canada, in a lot of ways, we're, we, you know, our plan is more aggressive and we're working on the finer details where, you know, the bigger jurisdictions have to deal with their bigger problems first, that we don't necessarily have the same, you know, similar issues. Mm -hmm. We're down what I would call the harder part of it, because it's a household and the transportation part of, of our carbon effort, but <coughs> like my intentions are to share everything with everybody so that we can, <coughs> you know, a lot of eyes are going to be on this type of thing all over PEI but all over the world, so if somebody can find something that can help us or help themselves, that should be something that we're all looking to do. Charlotte Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know we had, um, <coughs> when, we, when we talked about the initial, the preliminary information that was coming out of the forestry report and it was shocking, you know, and there was this kind of, there's a real genuine concern about that kind of, the, the, the scale of the loss of forestry. Um, where, where, do, where would we see in here? Like, is it perhaps again, it's in the net zero space, but but I know you talked about sort of programs and incentivizing to really encourage putting land back in because so we have to keep what we've got and we have to put back even though it's not necessarily going to be effective right away. Um, so I guess two questions. One of them is is where would that appear in terms of things like grants to to landowners or incentive programs and so on. And then the other side of it is. What do we do around that aspect of carbon capture in the interim? Because initially there is no carbon capture when we're in the replacement mode. Right. Like if we're down to 20% and we need to be at 40, then what do we do in the interim in the 30 years it's going to take to get there? Yeah, well, that's a tough question. question. That's, right. a, that's a really tough question. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, part, so to answer the first part, like part of it would be here through some of the program that we have, just okay. to the replant stuff. Mm -hmm. But then the, the thing about creating the value a lot of that is happening in the net zero office <coughs> where it's, uh, you know, trying to create the, the value for carbon credits for, for forests, so the, a sustainable forestry that we can, we can incentivize and, and uh, a sustainable product placement for, you know, for some of that wood, wood product, that, that type of thing, so that we, we do give it more value, but that would be in, in the, the net zero office. What do we do in the interim is, is, is uh, a really good question because we work hard to reduce <coughs> emissions but we know we have to sequester a lot of it and we know that our time frame is like 18 years now mm. so that it's really it's happening really really quickly so we have to you know look at what our other op options are besides forestry but we, we have to be super careful to take care of what we have left standing and that we allow it to grow and, and get to its full capacity and that we that we sequester carbon out of the the stuff that um, the member from O'Leary was talking about the stuff that's laying on the floor we can still sequester that carbon rather than let it rot in the woods and, and release its carbon we can still sequester that and that's where things like biochar come into place like can we can we pyrolyze it and and add value to it and make it a product that can be be used and I think I think that's where we can sequester carbon in the in interim, is save what's there so it doesn't release its carbon. Charlotte on Belvedere. Yeah, my follow up to that one is, you know, my colleague had mentioned earlier about the planting of like white spruce versus, you know, other more like Acadian forest types of planting. And I know there's been, there's some really specific data around varietals that, that are better at, you know, have more bang for the buck in terms of what you get, maturity rate, and also sort of the amount of carbon that they sequester. I mean, like hard nut trees. Um, black walnut is like is the highest one of the highest rated. There's a there's this is really odd set of, of varietals, um, and and is that something else that, that we could look at? Is sort of you know, yeah. white spruce is low on the list, 
you know, nut trees are higher on the list, is there a way that we can actually sort of think about sort of what it is that we're planting as well as where we're planting? Because quality is, is, is actually going to be better in some cases than quantity if we've got a limited amount of land that we can use. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that I think we have to have that discussion because we have to look, if we're planting something that's a 30, 40, 50 year tree or, or longer, we have to look at climate change 30, 40, 50 years out and say, is this the tree yeah. that can sequester carbon 30 years from now? Or is it, will the climate have changed too much for that tree to be yeah. successful in this, in what the new ecosystem is? Or like what, are, what changes could happen? So I think that way above my education level. We could but be planting so, olive trees. We could, we could right. be. Like in terms of in terms of our our latitude, we're on the same latitude as Spain. Right. We could, if our climate change projections come through, we could be sitting in a Mediterranean climate right. in 30 or 40 years. In which case, we are talking about varietals that won't exist anymore, right. and varietals that will be able to be planted here that have never been able to be grown here before. 100. percent and, and and that I know we can't plan for that, but but there's a transition again. The transition, right? I think we have to plan for it somehow, though. Like we we have to note it and start looking and saying what's in what's a uh, mid -ter or midterm change that we can make, or what's something that can 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 survive well in both. If you know, I don't think we know it's going to change. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to continue to our temperature is going to continue to, to rise. There's nothing that's going to stop it in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Like, I mean, the goals are to to reduce it to one and a half degrees Celsius. It's not to like, not to go back to where we were. No. Nobody even talking that yet. They're just saying, how do we slow it down from getting warmer? So we have to accept the fact that things are going to be different. And I mean, it'll it'll impact agriculture too. What crops can be grown here? It'll impact our healthcare system and how it's delivered. It'll impact how service gets delivered to um, PEI from a number of different um, angles. And I mean, that's part of what our net zero planning is about, and that's part of what our adaptation strategy is about. So it's kind of an exciting time to be involved in the conversation because it's we're just at the start of it. Sure, I'm over there. Thank you. And just because of the segue, um, so I'll have a call out today about the adaptation um, um, consultations in the, in the public. So I really appreciate those happening and, and that they're across the whole province. I also really appreciated that you asked kids to come. Um, you know, it's critical because it's, it's after all, it's them. <laughs> You know, it's, yep. um, and the the adaptation part of the adaptation thing is is, is that it's 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 there's a what are we doing in the interim as well as what do we do for later on and and I think you know like you said when you talked about this in terms of sort of being open to suggestions and ideas, I know a lot of people will laugh when I if I talk about Mediterranean crops, but but we do actually have to have those conversations without that judgment that comes with you're crazy because it's not anymore. Yeah. Um, and um, but I but I do really appreciate that we are doing that consultation in a timely space now, and that it is inclusive to that point of, of, of listening to younger people's voices. Um, and I like to really talk about that more when we get to the net zero sure. net zero piece. Um, I'm good for there now. Thank you, Chair. Sure, I'm broken. Uh, thank you, Sam. So I'm looking forward to the tree report, and I, I'm assuming we'll get decent numbers uh, telling us where we have the woods, whether they're little seedlings or big trees or whatever they are, and maybe even numbers on how much carbon is stored there. But the other edge of the equation is the wood you take out from the forest. Uh, how do you track that, if you do? Do you track that at all? <clears throat> yeah, it's a great question because <clears throat> there are, like our inventory numbers are pretty rudimentary on how they're collected. So the, the conversation with the groups like the Woodlawn Owners Association and, and the, the importance of them being together to do it is so that we can measure it better or at all. It's really, I, I, I had the same questions as you. I don't know if I've ever gotten an answer good enough that I could give you an answer that you're going to be satisfied with. Sure, I think we have some work to do. Because it obviously makes a big difference if you if you take out an acre in, say, wood chips, or whether you take it out in lumber. You know, the lumber yeah. will Agreed. will store, and the other stuff just gets right out into the air. Which brings me to a chip question that I already uh, asked the Minister for Transportation, but he didn't seem to quite 
know the answer. Uh, does the, prov the province buys a lot of chips. You have all kinds of chip burners there. And uh, although you don't buy the chips for the waste to energy, you buy all the heat that comes from the chips to waste to energy. Yep. Do you have any kind of program that differentiates between uh, chips from uh, uh, sustainable forestry versus just going out and clear cutting and chipping the whole thing? We don't, but we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a point well taken. We do need to. So uh, when I met with the with the uh, Woodlard Association's members Saturday, there was a lot of talk about uh, carbon credits. I'm sorry, I, I had a little bit hard time hearing what it was, but if I understand it correctly, uh, uh, polluters elsewhere will essentially pay, uh, potentially pay uh, woodlock growers for growing wood and storing more carbon. Uh, how? How near is that? How soon is that coming? We're, we're working hard on it because, so I'd like to have it as soon as possible because it's going to be an important part of us being able to claim our sequestration, right, is that we have it in an or organized fashion. And I don't think that, you know, I know it has to go to an open market for the credit system mm -hmm. to work, but I'd like to think that, that we would buy them and just keep them in the province versus having, like, the work of... In, you know, the work of them go to somewhere else. I'm, I'm kind of torn on the carbon credit system, but I think it's an important to create an opportunity for them to make make money, and I think that, you know, wherever we can, we should just try to keep them in the province. We can't claim them twice, so it doesn't matter, but I think we can pay for them. Well, I totally agree with bringing some money to the province, or to the Woodlot owners in particular. I don't know if we want to keep the polluting part here. But I never really liked that part of the agreement. Uh, I don't really actually, I think it's kind of a slightly fraudulent because it doesn't really, we need to save the earth, not just PEI. But yeah. anyway, uh, are you saying that you would, you would provide the funding here and that would enable us to drive more gas cars or that sort of thing? Uh, no, I wouldn't be using it to try that. Like, I don't know. It's a, it's a philosophical debate, though. Like, I think the, what, what Catherine McKenna is going to do with the UN it, to, to, to put a, a measuring system in place to ensure that um, companies that say they're doing things are doing them mm -hmm. is kind of the, where my head is at. Like, yeah. <clears throat> I don't believe that. So I, I guess the reason why I would say I think we should buy them is I don't believe we should create a sustainable, develop, or a sustainable forestry model here on PEI that somebody in Detroit City can buy to claim their net zero and do nothing else. I, mm -hmm. I think that, I think it's because I have, uh, uh, it It doesn't match my, my principles on the issue. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason I would move okay. on. Not so that we wouldn't, not to, so that we wouldn't have to take our own steps. Mm -hmm. It's, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure if I believe in them that I guess what I'm saying. I believe that the Woodlot owners should be rewarded for that work, yep, yep. and they should get the, get that value. But I'm not sure that somebody who is doing nothing to stop pollution should be able to buy them and say, "Look at us." I think that's. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I think we could have several lunches discussing that. Right. Uh, right. right uh, uh, my uh, my question is, how how soon? Uh, how far out uh, is that kind of arrangement? I'm speaking about the Woodlot owners. Is it, is it like? Uh, Years and years, or is it something no, we're talking soon. about? Specific? It's got to be soon. soon. I'll get you yeah. the. I'll have to get an update from John, who's working on it, <clears throat> and uh, I'll get back to you. But it, like, we need it soon. We need it to happen really, really soon. Thank you. Uh, another thing you mentioned was uh, biochar, which is the thing I've been chatting to people about for a while too. Which is a great promise for not only storing carpet but also improve. Uh, Soil quality, is there anything actually happening in that respect that yeah. you can tell us about? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a number of companies that are, are doing it. Some are, have reached out. They, they're looking to set up here. They're not, they're not looking for anything else. They're not looking for, you know, I've never talked to anybody who's asked us for, for anything. They want to know that they have a, they're going to have a feedstock, and they want to know that there's going to be 
uh, and you support at the other end, so that somebody's going to take it. But I think yeah. that you know through the different uh, farming groups, and I think they have a lot of interested parties who are like, I could see this working for us. So yeah, I think we're, like I would have liked to have somebody set up here this year. Yeah, but. Yeah. So it's really, I think it's something that we are going to be able to realize on. Great. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Okay. Fish and Wildlife. Appropriations provided for the administration and management of various programs designed to conserve, protect, and enhance the province's fish and wildlife resources as well as financial support to community-based organizations through the Watership Management Fund. Administration, 25500 Equipment, 17500 Material supplies and services, 114000 Professional services, 7500 Salaries, 1122300 Travel and training, 50000 Grants, 4617200 Total fish and wildlife, 5954000 Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, regarding species at risk, I'd asked about this before uh, in QP. So are there any species designated at risk currently by the department? I wouldn't have that with me, do you? No. Well, I'll bring that back to you. Um, is there any funding in the budget for a strategy or plan for the protection of specific species? I think there's, there was legislation on our, on our legislative plan. Yes? It wouldn't show up here, but I mean... So we, we, the province currently doesn't have species at risk legislation. Legis legislation. Not to the degree I think that's been requested. Right. So we're, we're, we cover it through a various other legislation, but there's it's on the books of our legislative plan, but I have to get an update beyond that. I would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's been raised, um, you know, you fund you fund various groups who do work on species at risk, and or they protect the natural areas, so like Island Nature Trust and Nature Conservancy, which is obviously really awesome. But how do you coordinate that work that you're funding to make sure that those projects achieve desired outcomes in terms of Protection, or, or do those groups just determine their priorities back to you? Is there like what's that relationship like with that funding? I will have to get that for you. But this is a, a similar. We had a similar concern whenever we we started working with the Nature Conservancy and Island Nature Trust to buy to buy land. That we so we had to coordinate our efforts in that area so that we weren't trying to buy all the same. Yeah. We didn't get in a bidding war, not knowing that that. We were both trying to buy the same land with the same money and drive the costs up. So um, I suspect that this has been dealt with in the department already, but I'll get that for you. Thank you, because obviously, you know, in favor of, of community groups that, that can have that autonomy um, and, and, you know, immediacy of direction. And, and obviously, these are really, really phenomenal groups, but at the same time, we want to make sure that that's aligning. Um, if there is, you know, an overall plan within the department, for example, or if not, that there are your experts who are going to be able to tell you, and, and they have told you that they are really concerned about um, the absence of a clear species at risk plan and the absence of there being any species, as far as we're aware, that have formally been protected. It's something that's been raised directly by these groups. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, we, our role is to, is to bring that, that advocacy forward again and just say, um, you know, you mentioned, for instance, a legislative plan um, or work uh, for a program delivery basis. If there's, if there's funding that's specifically allocated to work on that aspect around species at risk, wherever that may be, in the department as well as the work that's happening out the department. Yeah, I'm sure that we do, but I, I wouldn't have that detailed information with me, but I'll get it for you. Is it in your plan to establish an advisory committee for species at risk, which was one of the asks from the community groups to begin to address this gap? I think our goal would be to work towards a legislative framework that would have that in it, so it's a more uh, reporting, a whole entire reporting structure built into the legislative process. 
Well, and the reason for asking for an advisory committee chair is, is because it obviously brings uh, that external expertise into right. the department to inform that forward, so it's not being done in, in isolation. Right. I would um, say that we have expertise, though. Yeah. I would agree, but we also have expertise in the community. That's why you fund the community groups, right. because you're recognizing that expertise sits in the community and that they can do things outside the space of the department that you may not have the capacity to do, or, or sometimes it's just a different perspective, yeah. or a different set of relationships, networks, whatever that may be. They're the ones who put the boots on some days, <laughs> right? Right. So, so there is, you know, when we talk about consulting, it's not just um, checking in with the community to get the temperature. It's, it's about bringing in another opinion or expertise that may challenge you and your department and the internal experts to, to shift a position. I think we get that a lot. <laughs> I'm sure you do. do. I'm encouraging you to keep doing yeah, it. We definitely do. <laughs> okay. There's been a very clear identified gap around yeah. species at risk. I and know, it's, it's definitely noted, yeah. yeah, no question. Okay, so uh, what I'm asking is if you can bring back something that sort of, if that is on the radar, how, what that looks like, sure. so that we can we can speak I to it. I think it's based off legislation that you guys had on the floor. Probably, it yeah. It is, I'm, I know it is. Yeah, so. well and then that's a separate conversation that we can have about sure. moving that forward, but um, it, it, it's pretty critical, and, and those partner groups uh, you know, it's always we've always talked about this before. You know, no matter how much we value them, they're also in a very difficult position of only being able to push so hard because yeah. you fund them too, right? It, make, it makes it whatever <laughs> that may feel like from your side, and I'm sure it's really difficult. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably very, more difficult for them. It's very difficult for them because yeah. it's only so hard that, that community groups can push when they're also talking to their funder, yeah. and that's why sometimes us sitting in here and asking those questions is the reason we have to do it, hard as they may be, because it's we're the ones that can do that. So yeah. I'm advocating for species at risk, please. Perfect. Noted. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other aspect around it, which I know is part of the complexity of this, is about 90% of the land on PEI is privately owned. So wildlife protection becomes way more complicated. And you mentioned earlier about even just sort of who's purchasing what land. We have a, you know, benchmarks of, of land that we want to put into trust, um, which are quite challenging for PEI because of the percentage of, of private ownership. Um, so the other alternative to that is, 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 is the department involving the public in the measures to protect wildlife. We see that really effectively with the Sandpiper protection education campaign up the North Shore. Um, is that something else that you've got in the budget in terms of um, incentivizing landowners, for example, to protect habitats on private land? Uh, I don't know if we would have that in the budget, do we? There is, um, in the environmental land management, the Alice right. thing to lead hay cutting for um, yeah. right. species at risk, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's the only one I can kind of think yes. of that's direct is is, is a, which is a relatively small it is yes. program, and um <laughs> and sits under the under the management of agriculture and land rather than under here. So so it, it's not necessarily primary objective for that department. It's an outcome. Right. Um, and when we're talking about some of these species, which are not just at risk but into endangered like um, hill swallows. Um, I mean, I know you've talked about it in in. Uh, more in your district or in other districts around when people go in and sort of, you know, cut down the embankment <laughs> and, you know, that's an example. Um, so that kind of involvement of the public in measures to protect requires direct investment under that purview of, again, the species at risk file, rather than being a secondary outcome of an agricultural project. Okay. Um, and you'd mentioned the budget for buying land or, comp or, or um, working with other partners. Is there a budget to into, or a percentage outcome of what you're trying to achieve for Preservation. Yeah, so we, I think we have a million dollars. Is that in this budget? In, yeah. In this section? In the current year forecast, we, we had with l and Trust and NCC $2.1 million. Okay. Our budget was seven fifty, and we did invest $2.1 million. Okay. But it's working <laughs> towards our 10% our goal. But like I said earlier, that <clears throat> they have mapped out, like so I'll take on Nature Trust, who I have the closest relationship with. They map out, here are the areas we're working in, and we're going to try, try to do this. and and then protect it. So then, it wasn't that awful long ago, I had a big pile of, of uh, protection, uh, what do they call it? You know, the Napa. Napa, the Napa designations. It came across my, my desk for Island Nature Trust properties. Mm -hmm. So then, then they were protected. But <clears throat> they're working towards 
same goals that we're working towards, I think they can probably do it more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and Chair, that may be, I mean, I know, I think it's 750,000 was what you had um, to Nature Trust and then 375,000 to Nature Conservancy and then there was another 300,000 for various forested landscapes. So there's clearly money going out on the table, but um, yeah, it's again about that coordination of sort of what, what goals you're trying to achieve. I mean, I know um, federally there are goals for protected land percentages, so it's like 4% of certain type, I can't remember the numbers, but there's certain percentage goals, and I know that like in the PEI, there's always that additional challenge because of the private ownership numbers really throw it off, along with Crown or um, land designated as, as, the, as First Nations or, or protected territories. So. Um, just for me, maybe a take back is just sort of what is that? What is that goal that you've discussed with the with the groups in terms, and how does that relate to how much money they've got? Because it, maybe we need to talk about a bigger budget to purchase the land now. Yeah, well, I would definitely give them more money. Yeah, I have no issue with that. But yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll get you whatever information we could have on that. Okay. But I would definitely give them more money. Um, and and as you know, land is becoming harder to obtain yeah. per acre per dollar. Right. So. And, that's, and that's the concern, like the longer, longer the harder it gets, so it's yesterday was a better day than today, right? right. My last question in this section was just around the, just a, just a really big jumps and differences in the, the forecast to estimate to budget on grants, and I think you just mentioned it briefly there, if you could just go back to that one, what was the, the reason behind that? In grants? Yeah, so there was like a, estimated was like 3 million, it went up to 7.5 in the forecast for the 2021-22, and then we're back to 4.6. So in the fiscal year 21-22, this is where we have the project-based watershed management fund. Ah, okay. That was the big jump. And we also had some federal um, increases as well on those right. federal programs. Right. No, that, that makes sense. Again, talking about bringing projects and program delivery in under the department and, and, and that piece yes. was the, the consolidation. <coughs> and so that's now being reconciled into the 22-23 going forward for the watershed groups are all showing up with the... I'm looking at it there. That's a lot of grants. Yeah, okay. Talking out loud, that makes sense. <laughs> We're doing the numbers in my head saying, does this work? I think it works, but anyway. No, I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Through the third party. Yeah. Under salaries, about $117,000 increase. Is that new positions or part-time turned into full-time positions? There is one new position there, um, as well as there's an allowance there for potential no negotiated increases under uh, collective agreements. Okay. Now it says watershed fund ma or watershed management fund. So is this where the watersheds get their funding? That's correct, yes. So um, do we have a break? Can we get a breakdown of the grants? Like they seem to take a considerable jump and then go back to close to what they were in 2021. Can we have a handout of those grants? <coughs> I don't have a, a something I can table, um, but what happens is that we show um, the grants at around um, late January when we're preparing for the budget. So there might have been second installments issued since then, up to March 31, and then the additional uh, investment in 22-23 will be determined um, to be distributed to the groups based on the funding formula. Um, so that's why you would see not necessarily um, 22-23 allocated to the groups, but it's a lump sum that needs to be distributed based on that funding formula. Okay. <clears throat> Are you aware of the number of watershed groups that you have? 25? I could count them. Yeah. Approximately, I think this. Yeah, 23 20, to 25. 24-25? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Now, so there's a formula. Not enough. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Ahead. There's a formula for the funding, correct? Yes. <laughs> yes. And everybody Quite falls. Open. Everyone falls under that same formula. Yes. So if a group is more active than, than another group and they put a great big project together, and they get a whole bunch of funding, versus another group getting almost nothing or a small amount to do a project, the the formula is fair and it's equitable to all groups. Well, it's their formula. 
So the Watershed Alliance came up with their own formula, okay. and it's based on watershed size and land mass and a number of different things that they, they calculated on. So that's their core funding. But the other fund we have is the $2 million one that they can apply for for grant money to build like a capital project. But it, it's administered between us and the Watershed Alliance. Okay. Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Under these grants, so is that a purchase of any land for Island Nature Trust or anything like that? Have you purchased land? Yeah, not the watershed one, but yeah, there's the, the money for the grants is in there. It's on. That's, that's in a different department? Well, it's on, no, it's on your, if you're on your grants page, it says uh, the Island Nature Trust is on there for $750,000 on the handout. And the Nature Conservancy is there for. Okay, uh, I guess I missed the was there handout given? Okay. Yep, but they're in. Yep, they're in the handout. All right. So, did we get a handout of the grants, of the total grants? Yep. I, I think, think so. so. Do you want mine? No, if we got yes. them, I can. No. I'll have a copy of it if you want. Okay. okay. Well, that, you can have it. Fine. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, that's that's it for me now, Chair. Thank you. Shall a section carry? Summerside Wilmot. I'll be quick on this one. You may have already answered this, and if you did, I apologize for that. I'll answer it again anyway. So, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for Island Nature Trust. Do you have a sense of how much land that will protect this year? Oh, we Has will get that. that There's been they bought some large swaths of land. They one of the areas they were working on is on the. Oh, what would you call that area? It's, it'd be on the Cardigan Road between Cardigan and St. Peter's. It's a, a large land of like maybe marshland, mixed with marshland swamp, uh, probably has some like bog, peat bog type stuff in it. They bought some like mega swaths in through there. So if those are those would be at a really low dollar per acre value. Then they would buy they would have bought some more expensive stuff. But I'll get what, what, what we know that they have, but it it was quite a bit. They did a really good job with the money this year. They did a bang up job actually. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that they do incredible work. I don't have a doubt about that. I know you have a target, original target of 7% protected land. I think your new updated target is 10%. How much money would we need in the budget in order for us to achieve that target? And is this enough to do that? Boy, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, the, it would be a lot, and it's not that I wouldn't be opposed to going and getting it, but would... Would we, would we throw the, would we throw the market at a whack if government put thirty million dollars on the table to buy buy land? Would we, would we skew the whole market at the, the same time? So, I know you'd like to do this quicker, and so would I. But I'm, I'm uh, acutely aware of the negative impacts that could happen because of doing it too. But a lot of money, but I think that we're committed. Am I okay, Chair? Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So, don't think you should purchase it all in one year. Okay. I definitely understand the implications of that, but the 10% target was your target, I believe, right? Yes. So, do you have an idea of when you're hoping to achieve that by and how many acres, roughly, we need to protect a year, which ties back to this budget line, on whether or not we will get towards that goal? Yeah, so I think we're, we only just hit six, didn't we? Can I, I, think. I, I think it's just. <coughs> Six and it took forever to get to six, so I, I don't know. I'd have to get you the, the exact numbers. It's a, but it, it's a really it's a tough job. But that's why the partnership with the Nature Trust is so important. Is that they can be more aggressive and they can go to they can go to some of the sales at the courthouse where where we can't like the tax sales where we really can't be involved. I get you know what I mean. Like we're, Department of Finance is trying to recover funds with those. Um, but they've been very successful there with some of their, their money. But I'll get you the <coughs> exact number, but uh, it is a constant uphill battle. Yeah. My Good. last question on this, Chair. I know that the target for protecting 7% land was trotted out in the 90s. We were going to get there by the year 2000. We've missed it and missed it and missed it again. So it's it's great to have targets, but if we're not putting the dollars behind it to actually achieve those outcomes, it just feels like an announcement to announce something. Yeah. So uh, when you brought in a more aggressive target, I do believe you want to get there, and you've talked about different pathways that you can work to solve more than one problem at the same time. I think that's a great thing. I'm just wondering if you feel that 
Seven fifty is going to be enough to put you on that track. No, I don't. But, but I, I don't. I, I honestly don't. But I think that we were trying to make sure we have a we have the mechanics of a system that that work, and I think that that we do. We don't have, uh, you know, we're internally. I've said we should have a focused strategy on how we would attain this and do it in partnership with our partners so that and that has been an, an ongoing conversation um, Island Nature Trust had some had changed they, they had I think the president shifted part way through through the year or recently probably around Christmas time or so and uh, not that that, slow, that didn't that didn't slow them down but we're back to you know, rebuild I uh, have a new relationship with a new person that when we're trying to continue on our goal so I think we need to put a proper strategy down so that we can fund it, but also so that we can knock on some doors and see if there's funds other places that would would help. Or are there other partners who would be interested in doing similar style work that would protect land that we could par partner with? I, I don't know that there's any, but I don't know if there's not either. I appreciate that. If anyone's already asked that, I apologize. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Shall the section carry? Total forest, fish, and wildlife, 12,810,400. Shall I carry? Yeah. Climate Action Secretariat. Climate Action Appropriations is provided to analyze and monitor trends in provincial greenhouse gas emissions, develop and administer a new climate change adaptation plan, support the Interdepartmental Climate Action Secretariat, administer the Climate Challenge Fund, and administer climate change-related federal provincial funding agreements, including the Low Carbon Economy Fund. Administration 19,500, equipment 55,000, material supplies and services 18,500, professional services 465,000, salaries 659,600, travel and training 33,500, Grants one million five hundred and eighty-seven thousand nine hundred. Total climate action two million eight hundred and thirty-nine thousand. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you explain the difference between this secretariat and the Office of Net Zero, which comes in the later section? Like why are they separate offices and which bits fall under? Yeah, the low carbon economy fund is is administered through there, so the money comes through there. And then gets goes over to where the different places. Am I right at that, Kelly? Close. Yeah, that is correct. Yes. Okay, so yes. <laughs> I know it's at least close. And the low carbon economy fund is yeah. is the federal dollars, the, the federal fund funding money that then comes through this department and gets reallocated. Yeah, because obviously net zero was new and that relationship was already forged. So. Okay. So. So are there any programs that are delivered under the Climate Action Secretariat? This is where we do see the Climate Challenge Fund. Okay. And that would be under the grant grants line? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So things like, um, Chair, the like grants for things like the bicycle rebate and that kind of stuff are going to come in under Net Zero, the Office of Net Zero? Okay. Yeah. Um, Chair, does the Climate Action Secretariat coordinate, provide a coordination role, like in terms of climate change related activities we talked earlier about interdepartmental, is that part of the role of, of the Climate Action Secretariat? Yeah, so that, this is where our adaptation strategy is. Okay. So they, they lead the adaptation strategy, which requires them to do intergovernmental as well as the external part of it. So it's this department, it's this section that would be doing the, the, the that consultation role and so on, and then bringing that big and actually delivering and developing the plan itself. Yeah, this is them. okay. Oops. Um, so you're forecasted to give out 1.4 million in grants for 2021, 22, <coughs> um, and then we've got. I can find them. There was, you've got the Climate Challenge Fund in 21-22 in gave out 295,000 and then there was 78,000 went to the Atlantic Hub. So where's the other million gone? What happened to that in 
it's not in the grants handout. But those were the year-to-date expenditures at, say, approximately mid-February. Okay. But we have since ex expended the, the balance of the dollars. Okay. Um, so those are, are, at the moment now, we've spent, um, we've paid the Atlantic Hub, the full 87.4 that's in the forecast. Okay. And fully paid the Climate Challenge Fund out to March 31 projects. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's the difference. It's just, it's just the data printing versus the... In, okay. So where we've got 1.6 million um, for in this grants line for the 22-23, that's going to is that also going to be split between Atlantic Hub and then the the, the climate um, challenge fund? The breakdown there is um, there's a couple of different things. There's the Atlantic Hub, the climate challenge fund, and additionally there is the flood hazard identification mapping program, as well as coastal erosion mapping. Okay. Why is that one being done out of a grant slide? It's just a short-term project? Yes. It would probably be a project perhaps with UPEI or... Okay. <clears throat> Chair, with the Climate Challenge Fund, um, and we saw the most recent announcement of those, which included some companies that uh, I was really happy to, to advocate for and, and, uh, and see successful, what are you hoping to achieve with those, like it, you know, obviously it's really good community engagement. Um, it helps local companies or you know have a direct hand in, in activities. But, but what's the goal of the department in that fund? Because it's, it's a decent amount of money that's going it's, out the door. Yeah, I think it helps build build a capacity and it encourages the innovate, innovation side of it. And you know, we have groups now thinking we could we can do some of these projects. There's a fund uh, to help make them happen. So it's probably. A lot of things. It's a P it is a PR exercise too. We have to get people thinking this way, and I think that, you know, with the number of applications that we get, that the people have start to think think this way. So, um, long term, some of this stuff may end up happening, you know, in a clean tech environment, or, but you know, this would be the early stages of how we get groups kind of moving moving to be motivated with their innovative ideas. Sure. So, you know, we've seen sort of success with um, programs like the Ignition Fund in, in um, uh, economic growth, where, you know, that initial seed funding and, the, you know, that drives the interest, it, it kind of brings the spotlight onto entrepreneurship in that case. Um, and then you, you get a certain percentage of companies that go through that, like any will not succeed or they'll pivot or whatever, but some will will keep on going, right? And you'll get you'll get sort of a, a you know a robust company or a, a startup or whatever that may be. Um, is is that part of the hope with this or you know like I mean because some of these companies are, are established that are applying and some are, are non profits and then others are actual startups for example. Yeah like the the re refuel renewables uh, they're an example so they they received a hundred thousand dollars at the fund and I was at a conference yesterday in Halifax and they had a booth and it, at one moment, when I went to it, you couldn't get near because it had so many people around seeing what they were presenting. So I think that, you know, you know, I think there's an opportunity there to, for a significant amount of growth if we can kind of help get them launched. One of the things that we hear from economic growth is, is the, the tracking of that, like that kind of what, you know, what happened two years later or five years later sort of really does help sort of bring changes to the program. You know, I know there have been some major changes made. You know, we've provided feedback about diversity and inclusion that's made that program stronger, the Ignition Fund. We've also seen a change of it being shifting from export product only to being much more around local economy. So food products became eligible where they weren't before. Um, are you intending to do that same kind of longer term, like short term, long term tracking and assessment with this? Like, do you see the Climate Challenge Fund being an ongoing, recurring thing, or is it only meant to be a short term kickstart? Well, that's a good question. Uh, um, you know, I believe that any government program that expends this kind of expenditure needs to be reviewed yeah. and and measured for its effectiveness. So. Um, it is early. I mean, it's an, it's an early part. We're in an early stage of having this fund, but I think that we do need to do an appropriate evaluation and say, what did we do three years ago? Where did that money go, and how did it work, and where are those people now, and have they come back with more ideas, or have they been able to commercialize, or or change their 
industry for the better or whoever it is that yet. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't know long term. We always should have something like this available, but if we're not effective towards any measurable goals no. of success, then we, we would we, we probably should reevaluate. Re so, sure. I mean, I I I'd agree that. Um, it's really important to have some kind of ignition funding, whether it's business startup or whether it's something like this, you know, the challenge fund. It is a, a lot of money, and uh, but uh, but this kind of work, these kind, this kind of industry, and the kind of space that you're doing, twenty five thousand wouldn't be enough. Yeah. Um, a hundred thousand is a is a commercialization and development kickstart, but you know, I think I'm sure there's other things that are available. I'll be, I'll be honest, Minister, I see this much more as a as an economic driver. Like I see this as something that's going to relate more to the clean tech file and, and filling the spaces in your new park than, than potentially making huge immediate strides to our climate goals. But it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be funded out of the climate secretariat because there's a different expectation of outcome. If you're not, you're not driving this based on how many jobs did you create or did you go do an exportable product like we would see in economic growth, you're looking at it in terms of growing an industry, innovation, new ideas. So I'm, I'm never going to say no to that kind of investment, but it is enough money that we have to ask, you know, where's the oversight and, and, the, what, and, and the expectation, because there's a lot of other things we could also do with one and a half million dollars. Yeah, I don't disagree. I don't disagree at all. Yeah. So, you know, I, I do think it's fair to say that if you want to see local solutions and and local capacity developed that we should be investing in that and it's not necessarily going to have the same level of outcome as we planted 3,000 trees. <laughs> right? No. But I'd also like to be able to get to a point where we have excited partners mm -hmm. here spending their money too. Yeah. Like if, if the right players come in into the picture and and see value in in investing in those types of ideas I think that's how it becomes less of a government thing and more of a, an industry that just takes off and runs itself. So when we, I mentioned earlier about the clean tech park, and it's something that you've announced as, as you know, in, in your space. Where does that fit in your department? Oh, do you know where that is? It's in net zero. It's, in it's net under zero. office in net zero? Yes. Okay. All right. I'll ask, I'll ask some more around it around sure. it there. But there is, again, that, that kind of blurring of lines like we talked earlier about, uh, like land matters. And, you know, here it is about economic growth and, and business innovation and development. Have there been any conversations? Or I guess I'll ask in the next year. I was going to ask about what I said, but I'll, I'll wait till then okay. to ask that. Okay. Um, so back to the Climate Action Secretariat. Um, Was, is, does this department have enough resources to do the level of responsibility that it that it has right now? Because I mean, it's an intergovernmental strategy development, coordination, that climate, low carbon economy fund. That there's a lot of, of heavy lifting from a strategic perspective. Do you have enough resources in the department to do that? No, but we're, we have new positions right. in this budget, so. Yes, you're, we don't, but we will. And how many new positions do you have? Uh, five, six, five. With the three, three here in green. Yeah. And these two will become permanent. Okay. Yep. So the, there's three new ones, and they, we have uh, two that have people in them that will become permanent positions. Is that what comes under the professional services line, where you're, you're contracting versus them being salaried? Or is that something different? No idea. No, those are in salaries. So we have three new positions in salaries, as well as a plan to um, convert some, um, create two other new positions with ex existing dollars. Okay. Yeah. And then are you are you contracting for additional ex services external to the department as well, or is? No, not at this point. I don't think are we? The, those dollars relate to the flood flood hazard. And coastal erosion projects. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So that's another project that's ongoing in the department. Are there any other projects that are that are sitting under the mandate of this department, other than climate challenge, adaptation strategy, intergovernmental relationships, and the flood mitigation? 
No, that is that encompasses what the unit <clears throat> is responsible for. Okay. I'm I'm good there for now, Chair. Thank you. Leader of third party. So the equipment, could you give us a breakdown on that equipment? $50,000 worth of equipment. So those are potential expenditures under the flood hazard um, identification and mapping project in 2023. Specifically what they would intend to purchase, I'm not sure. Um, so those will be allocated between potentially computers, software, um, those sorts of items. How about the professional services? There's quite an increase in that. And those will be projects under the flood hazard identification and coastal erosion projects as well. Okay. Now, when you, when you come to uh, the grants, all I see under grants is the climate, the, the Atlantic Hub at 78,000 and the Climate Challenge Fund at 295. So it's 1.57 million you're projecting. Could you give us a breakdown of that? Like, am I missing that breakdown? I don't see it in my books here. No, so those are also the Atlantic Hub and the Climate Challenge Fund, as well as the flood hazard identification and mapping and the coastal erosion projects as well. So all those equate to about $1.2 million? $1.6 million in grants, yeah. Salaries. There was there was a the, the section there. Could you explain the salary increases? Yes, we have three new positions there. And what type? What type of positions are those? We have a junior policy analyst that's working on the adaptation strategy, uh, an ad adaptation coordinator, and a project coordinator to um, work on the flood hazard and high coastal erosion projects. Thank you. That's it for this section, Nathan. <coughs> Um, Charlottetown Belvedere. I'm um, sorry, Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have one question. Uh, you used the, uh, the word uh, effect or effectiveness a couple of times, and uh, in particular in regards to, um, to preventing CO2 emission. Uh, do you do simple evaluation of either project applications or the, when they're finished to evaluate? how it comes out, like CO2 saved per dollar spent? I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I know they do a robust evaluation mm -hmm. of them at the front end, but I don't know what the process is. Okay. But I'll yeah, I'd appreciate you. that. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Total Climate Action Secretariat, 2839000 Shall it carry? Environment and Water, Division Management, appropriations provided for the management and administration of the Environment and Water Division as well as Energy Rebate Program, Administration 8,700, Equipment 1,000, Material Supplies and Services 2,600, Professional Services 50,000, Salaries 244,100, Travel and Training 6,400, Grants 9,848,200, Total Division Management 10,161,000. Leader of the third party? So this, it seems to be a pretty constant, the figure's pretty constant, and this is just a given that these figures just basically stay the same. There's not too much new in this department. Yes, this is, is the division management for the Environment and Water Divi um, Division. Mm -hmm. um, the bulk of this program is the energy, um, energy, uh, sorry, um, energy rebates, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it, Chair. Okay. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. When will the irrigation strategy be finalized? Soon. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really soon. Define really soon. I think we're, tr we're expecting to try to get it on the cabinet agenda, which I don't control any time. You don't control the cabinet agenda? Well, really? I don't get the final say. I can say, <laughs> can we can we deal with this? Yes. 
soon. <laughs> Why do I feel that you perhaps might be able to share some more? Uh, like early in May. We're hoping to have something ready to announce it. That's a long time from when we were first promised it. Well, I only do, I only do my job. I can't do the rest of them. Do you anticipate needing more resources for the department to administer the irrigation strategy, or is that reflected in your budget? Because your budget hasn't really changed very much, really, in terms of salaries or anything, so I'm a little worried about how you're going to manage that. Okay. Okay, there's not none. Is that in? Is this is division manager. Okay. Air freight will be in the next okay. section. It's... <laughs> I think that's in the next section. In water and air quality yeah. monitoring? Doesn't show up in there either. Just, just give you the heads up now. There's not really a substantive <laughs> change there either. Yeah, no, all, no I, we've, we've always talked about, and I think we've, I've been, I did a couple of interviews on it where I kind of nibble at the ends, edges of talking about it, but I, we have, I've said, I think we should look at water as an, as a, an agency or a Crown Corp or something and have a, put all the people from all the departments that deal with it there instead and take the government proper out of the process and just and then kind of like with energy you have to legislate and regulate appropriately and they just follow the process so I think we're going to look at that with this the focus has been on the regulations for extraction and I think when, once we move past that the next project is looking at water holistically and what do we need to do to take that next step. Chair? Go ahead. Um, are, are the uh, regulations going to be released at the same time as the irrigation strategy is finalized? I guess. I don't know how that part's rolling out, but okay. I'll get you better information than on that, but yeah. Okay. Um, have you finalized the governance structure? I guess that's kind of connected to what you were just speaking about in terms of, but if you're going to roll out the strategy, part of the recommendation of that strategy is a governance structure in terms of how to manage that. So has has that been finalized to be done within the department, or are you looking at an arm's length We'll, we'll have body? to do it ourselves at the start, for sure. Pardon me? We'll have to do it in with the structure that we are able to use at the start, okay. which is kind of a, a mix of us and other people, but I'll get that precisely for you. So that's going to happen within the current budget envelope? Um, okay. Are you looking at that being in place for the next year, and so we're not going to see some change to that until sort of the next budget cycle, or is it going to be more accelerated than that? Well, I, I don't know. That's a good question because I, I don't, I don't want to be presumptuous and say that this is what we'll find and this is what our sol solution will be. Mm. So if it's a complex solution, it may have it may take a longer time timeline to implement. If it's if it's simple, and I don't know how complicated it is to create an, an agency or new governing body to, to take something like that on. I really don't mm -hmm. know the, every, all the steps that we would have to go through to, to enable that. So I, I wouldn't, I'd like to see it happen really, really fast, but I'd like to see everything happen really, really fast, so. Really soon. I know, so. Yeah, and it depends whether you're talking, that there are multiple different structures that could be from a Crown Corp all the way, all sorts of things, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, challenging to ask questions about it other than needing I that know. irrigation challenging strategy. Challenging to answer them too, so. Yeah, well, there you go. We're both having a fun time. Um, okay, how about I ask you about some grants instead? Sure. So, uh, one of the grants listed um, under the <coughs> energy rebate is an energy rebate for propane. Yes. Right? How is a rebate for fossil fuel appropriate for climate action? Great question. It is, I know. That's yeah. what I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, we have to look at how we, we have to look at what we're do, doing there, I guess, uh, um, and at what our policies look like, period, so. So when are you planning on doing that? Because we have talked about this a number of times. Well, do you know what? I would have done it in, in the winter, and we've had discussions about it in the winter, and then the the gas prices skyrocketed, every, and everything kind of went out of whack, so I was like, better 
touch the brakes on that one, but uh, actively being discussed anytime someone will listen to me in the department that we need to we need to move away from that. But I don't know if this was the year because of the situation that we're in when the budget was coming together. So, I mean, it's, it's an investment of four hundred plus thousand dollars. Yes. It's not a small investment. It's just a second. You know, it's obviously a significant rebate, yeah. um, and I absolutely I get the pain of of. of, of the pain of what this will be at the same time. We just don't have time to I know. keep kicking it down the road the same way we don't have time to do, you know, the propane, the wood pellet, the fire, you know, there's a point in here where, where things become unsustainable, not just from an environment, but just in terms of the, 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 the mitigation costs, the impact of them. Yeah, I don't disagree. Those are the exact discussions that... And, and um, okay. Yeah, because obviously we have we have we have a challenge when we have subsidies that are going to fossil fuels, and we are trying to balance that out with activities that are not. I agree. <laughs> I do agree. Okay. Well, following on that line, you're planning a carbon rebate program with about a quarter of the revenue from the carbon tax. Um, the rebates are the re is that rebate going to come under the grants in this section? Because the fossil fuel rebates currently are there, so is that going to come under this section as well? Or is it somewhere no, else? That's, the that's in the net zero office. In the net zero office? Yeah. Okay. So a carbon rebate, or well, the relief program for the carbon rebate, is entirely managed out of the net zero? Yeah, because it's delivered through efficiency. Through efficiency PEI? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move my questions from that to that section. Sure. Um, doesn't mean I'm not going to ask them, though. Just so you know. Okay. Um, I'm okay for now on this one. Charlotte Ann Brighton. I was wondering if you could tell me a little, little bit more about the uh, electricity rebates, which is, I believe, the major part of the number, if I understand it right. Yeah, so, I mean, that be came with the energy accord, and the price w of energy was going to go up, and the government of the day directly rebated islanders by putting this money forward. That's my, my understanding of it, and <clears throat> just never has gone away, because how do you take it away? So how is this rebate distributed? It's on your bill, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a 10% rebate, and it's applied to the customer's bill um, with Maritime Electric and Summerside Electric. So you basically, the more electricity you use, the bigger rebate you get. So you, you're rewarding the big users and giving it, very little rebate to small users. It is on residential, for customers only. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Are you considering any any end date sunset set clause on this, or are you just going to carry forward with that? Well, that's a great question. I, <clears throat> we can always use our money for more effective outcomes in the, the projects towards climate change that we have. So, you know, it's a catch-22, do I want to put electricity rates up 10% <laughs> this, this year? But I know we could use that money to help, to help with the probably save the same 10% with efficiency upgrades and $10 million go a long way there. So I know that doesn't answer your question, but. No, but I, I agree. It's a, it's a dilemma, politically yeah, speaking. Yes, it is but, a dilemma. Uh, uh, what I'm worried about is that the money goes to the big users and the small users that <coughs> probably need it the most uh, I agree. get very little. I agree. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. Shall the section carry? Air. Water and air monitoring. Appropriations provided to administer and issue high capacity well approvals, air quality permits, conduct air quality monitoring, undertake groundwater and surface water quality and quantity monitoring, and prepare groundwater and surface water reports. Administration 13,300. Equipment 34,000. Material supplies and services 55,300. Professional services 148,500. Salaries one million thirty four thousand, travel and training fifty seven thousand four hundred, grants one hundred thousand, total water and air monitoring one million four hundred forty two thousand five hundred.
Shall the section carry? Cheryl Helm Belvedere. The grants forecast in 21-22 is way off what was budgeted. Could you just speak to that, please? We had funds um, earmarked for a project on high capacity wells. High capacity wells? Yes. And you didn't use it? I'd have to. No, it's in the forecast. Okay, but we had a million dollars. Yes, in our forecast okay. for a research project on high capacity wells. Okay. <clears throat> um, so is that going to be, is that, was that a one-time thing? Like you're not going to be doing that again this year, you don't think? Yes. Okay. Um, are you expecting to grant permits for new high capacity wells this year? I suspect, yeah. Okay, so your overall budget in this section is pretty much unchanged. So there's, we're saying we don't think that this, you're going to run the irrigation strategy is going to be managed within your own department. You are likely going to be granting permits to new high capacity wells, but there's no real change in salary or support. So how are you going to do that within your, is that, you think you've, you've got enough capacity internally in the department to, to pull off those things appropriately? Things anyways, like they were, they've always been dealing with permitting of water through the department, so this is just a continuation of that. Right, but if the recommendation of the irrigation strategy is an expansion in monitoring, how, how do we, how do you, do you can address that within your existing envelope? We think we can, yeah, but, but like if somebody were, we don't, so you can't apply yet because there's no regulations to allow it, and when you can apply, like. We don't anticipate a rush, but we'll definitely not leave their staff stranded if we if there's a mad rush and we get all kinds of them. We we will change on the fly, but we don't think that we need to at this point. But if I'm wrong, then we'll fix it. Yeah. Um, if you're gonna do a special warrant, try and get it here before. <laughs> well, we can also shift money around too. Okay. okay. Um, Obviously, you know, the thing with it, if, if a high, new high capacity well is needed, um, it's going to be needed in a short time frame, like that, and they take time, right? It's, this isn't something you kind of go and think about on Tuesday and it gets done on Thursday. So there, there, there is going to be pressure um, if that is something that, that needs to happen. I mean, the other question, I guess, coming back to sort of the, a million dollars spent on project, what was the project for? Like, what did that do? Was that, was that to help sort of provide support and infrastructure for the new? That was the UPI project. That was the assessment project. Yeah. Okay. Honorable well, members, we've concluded government time for today. That's a good one. We'll come back later, right? Did you tell you that? No. <laughs> they only have a half an hour and then. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having it on consideration, the uh, consideration of the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg leads to report the committee has made some progress and begs lead to sit again. I move that the committee uh, report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The honourable member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request that motion number 101 now be called. Shall I carry? 
Motion 101. The Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown Belvedere, the following motion. Whereas health care and school staff are among the most critical frontline workers on PEI, and whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed cracks in both the health care, long-term care, and school systems on PEI, which must be addressed, and whereas the pandemic provides an opportunity to improve these systems for the well-being of our children, our seniors, and all Islanders, and whereas the official opposition have received a number of emails from nursing staff, teaching staff, and paramedics who disguise their identity for fear of reprimand, and whereas frontline experts should be allowed and encouraged to speak out when conditions are unsafe or toxic, and whereas it is apparent from emails and videos where ident identities are disguised and from listening to our frontline workers that speaking out often results in reprimand, and whereas government has tools it can use to end this culture. Therefore, be it resolved, the Legislative Assembly urge government to work towards ending the culture of silence in the PEI public sector. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to launch, following consultation with relevant unions, a comprehensive education campaign to inform civil servants of their legal rights and protections, including as they relate to communications by civil servants that disclose wrongdoing, poor working conditions, and other work-related concerns. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to provide public sector workers safe pathways to raise their concerns, including and particularly where no legal rights and protections exist. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to start debate. <coughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise here and talk to this motion. It's a while since we broached the the topic of whistleblowing in this legislature a few years ago. It was a, a topic of uh, great discussion. And of course, the history of whistleblowing on, uh, on the island dates back to a, a policy within government which was established in 2015, and which in the first couple of years of its existence had no, not a single complaint come forward. And at that time, we were the only province without legislation to protect whistleblowers. And of course, policy offers nothing like the same sorts of protections to whistleblowers as legislation does. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. So in 2017, the administration of the day brought forward the Public Disclosure um, Information and Whistleblower Protection Act, which is the legislation we have today. Uh, it's comparable in many ways to the legislation we ha that exists in other provinces, but it's also missing some important pieces. And uh, I remember in debate on this important bill, bringing forward amendments from the side of the House that we would like to have seen to strengthen the bill, but unfortunately were not incorporated. So I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the legislative and policy situation that we that currently exists here on Prince Edward Island because legislation is one of the parts of uh, ensuring that you have protection, sufficient protections for people to be able to come forward without fear of reprisal. But the other aspect is a more nuanced one, something which is perhaps not so black and white, and that's the culture of the organization within which uh, whistleblowing is either encouraged or discouraged. And so there are a couple of elements to this motion, which I look forward to sharing my thoughts, but also to hearing other members of this Legislative Assembly and, and their attitudes, their concerns, their feelings about where we sit in Prince Edward Island in terms of offering those supports and offering that safety so that people within our public service feel comfortable, they feel safe, they feel secure bringing forward concerns. And I want to start my more formal remarks, Speaker, by directly addressing the public employees across the public sector here in our province. And I first of all want to say, say absolutely categorically that we greatly value the work that you do every day in whatever department you, you do your work in order to improve the lives of islanders and across our public sector whether that be in healthcare or education or any of the other departments which provide public services to the citizens of this province, it is the public sector and the workers and the employees in that public sector who are providing those services, and we appreciate that. 
we understand what an important and critical job that is, and sometimes what a difficult job that is. And they deserve our support, and they deserve our accolades. So thank you to every single public servant of this province. I want to particularly thank those civil servants who do speak out when they see mismanagement, they see a toxic work environment, they see injustice or they see islanders perhaps being left behind or not served properly. And that must be an extraordinarily difficult decision to make. One that, of course, carries a lot of personal risk for that employee. You could be a long time, well, maybe you're a new employee, but you could be a long time employee of the public service. And typically whistleblowers, if you look at the data, um, they tend to be more senior, more seasoned um, employees with a lot of experience, far more aware of the culture and the organizations in which they live. Those are typically the people who do bring forward concerns. And of course, the further you are in an organization, the higher up you are, the longer you have been there, the greater the risks. So I want to particularly thank those who do come forward to point out the risks that are inherent in our system and for the, for the personal risk that they take in doing that. We absolutely should be populating our public service with those kinds of workers, people who are taking steps to protect the greater good, even if that means putting their own personal situation at risk. I look at whistleblowing as a sort of early warning system against corruption. And in order for whistleblowers to come forward and, and to do so, comfortably and safely, there's a couple of things that, that need to be in place in order for them to do this without fear of reprisals. I've already mentioned that there, there are, I think, two aspects to this. First is legislative, and we now have a whistleblowing act here on Prince Edward Island. I think weak though it is, it is in place now, and it does offer some protections for those who are brave enough to come forward. The other thing is is a dysfunctional culture which dissuades people from doing so. And that's a much more insidious and difficult thing to deal with. And of course, in all issues of whistleblowing, and we see it across the world, actually, and I'll talk a little bit about where Canada stacks up against other countries when it comes to protection of whistleblowers. It's not pretty, spoiler. Um, where there is a consistent contradiction and that is where often the truth tellers are punished and those who are wrongdoers often continue on without impunity. And we've seen that here on Prince Edward Island. Whistleblowers come forward, they lose their jobs, they are penalized. Um, sometimes it's very overt and sometimes it's more subtle, the ways that they are punished. And that has an extraordinarily chilling effect on a culture. And when you do not have a culture that encourages people to come forward and tell the truth about, about shortcomings in the system in which they work, that creates threats to public health. It creates threats to public safety and environmental health and, and, and to organizational accountability. All of those things are threatened when people within the organization are not encouraged to come forward to speak the truth when things are not going well. So we must protect those who tell the truth. And experts in the field tell us that Canada has some of the worst protections for whistleblowers in, in the entire world. And we're often sort of held up as an object of international ridicule because of the, the laxity of our legislation. Federally, for example, the, the the, uh, I can't think what it's called, but the, an act that was brought into place in 2007. In the first 10 years of existence of that whistleblowing protection, there were eight cases came forward in 10 years. Only one of those cases actually had the stamina to get to the end of the process, and they lost. So in 10 years of that whistleblowing um, legislation being in place, 
it produced precisely zero results. So we have a long way to go. We have, and of course, I'm, I mentioned earlier that Prince Edward Island was the very last province to enact whistleblower legislation. And in my estimation, we could have done a stronger job, particularly when you're not going first. When you, of course, when you go first with a piece of legislation, there are certain things that one has to um, imagine, I want to say guess at, but that's not the right terminology. But you're, you're charting new ground. But when you're the 10th province to come forward with a piece of legislation, you can look at the other jurisdictions and you can pick and choose what you like. And you should be able to bring forward the strongest piece of legislation of any province. And we sure as anything didn't do that. Whoops, I almost slipped off there, <laughs> speaker. So we have a history here on Prince Edward Island of being late to the game, of having a policy which didn't protect employees, and of uh, a piece of legislation that could be significantly improved. The Premier has said repeatedly that any civil servant should absolutely speak up when they have concerns. And I agree with him. They absolutely should. But the reality is that many of those civil servants don't feel safe to do that. And if they don't feel safe, they will find it far more difficult to speak out. They often fear that if they do speak out, they're going to face reprisals. And reprisals, as I said earlier, can take many forms. It's not, it's not just getting fired, although we have seen that. We've seen that in our province. Um, we've seen it very recently with a couple of deputy CAOs in Charlottetown. Um, but there could be other things as well. It can be uh, getting passed over for a promotion or a new position. It can be consistently getting undesirable shifts or not getting vacation requests approved. Uh, it, it, it takes many, many forms, but discrimination is sadly rampant. It's not just in our province, of course, and I don't want to suggest that, but we're no different. And indeed, when the leader of the province says that any civil servant should absolutely speak up when they have concerns, we are hearing in our office consistently from civil servants that they don't feel safe speaking out. And it's really important that we, ta that we firstly acknowledge that that is indeed the case. If we have civil servants, and this is not just one or two isolated incidents, this is, this is a series of concerns that have been brought to our attention repeatedly over the years that we've been in office as the official opposition. It's a culture of silence as the motion suggests. And the first thing that we must do to combat that is to acknowledge it, that, acknowledge that this is a problem, and to talk about it. And the first operative clause is exactly asking for that. So the kind of workplace environment that we have is critical. And when it's unhealthy, it will lead to employees, firstly, not coming forward with concerns, but also what a stressful situation to be in if you're watching wrongdoing, knowing that the right thing to do is to put your hand up and report this to somebody and, and not feeling safe to do that. What an extraordinary stress that must place on workers. And, and by the way, this motion is, is specifically about public service workers in, within the public service. But of course, the same sorts of problems exist in the private sector as well. But this motion is specifically about the public service, which is why I'm uh, I'm restricting my remarks to that, but I don't. I want to make sure that people are aware that this is not something which is just present in the public service. That it is absolutely present in the private sector as well. And that sort of environment, that unhealthy environment of of a lack of safety, a lack of uh, a lack of um, feeling secure to do the right thing, um, leads to employees disengaging from their work, leaving their work, perhaps. It leads to vacancies in government jobs. And ultimately, uh, that, of course, leads to a reduction in the, both the quantity and the quality of public services that we offer to islanders. This is something which has a profound, real, practical input on the day-to-day -day lives of the citizens of this province. And it really troubles me that the hardworking public servants who are reaching out to our office and are, are raising their concerns, they're doing that anonymously. Or they're seeking anonymity if our office wants to speak about them publicly. That's a real red flag that there are problems here. We see it in healthcare, we see it in education, we see it in other departments as well. 
Anonymity is the first big red flag that suggests that there is a lack of safety and that the people who are the truth tellers, the people who we need to hold up, the people who we need to protect are uncomfortable or unable to bring forward their concerns. It's a clear sign of people being afraid of reprisal. But I'm concerned about the substance of the concerns they're bringing to our office. It's not just the fact that they are seeking anonymity and they're disinclined to bring forward those concerns through appropriate channels that the act, um, the mechanisms in the act allow. The fact that they're reaching out to the official opposition anonymously is a real problem, but it's the nature of the concerns that they're bringing which is perhaps equally disconcerting. They often involve issues of public services not being provided appropriately, or worse, issues that could negatively affect the health and well-being of the public. We see all of these things. We hear about all of these things on a regular basis in our office. And that's why it's so critical that we create and promote a culture where people feel really safe to raise these concerns, where they feel, or even better, where they know that they will be supported when they come forward with these concerns. Workplace cultures are tricky things. They get established over a length of time, but they're not unmalleable. They can change. They're often a reflection of the values of the people who are heading those organizations and workplaces. And it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of dedicated and continuous effort in order to ensure that island public servants have a workplace where they not only feel comfortable coming forward with their concerns, but where ministers and senior leadership will actually listen to them and take the appropriate action to address those concerns. There has to be uh, there has to be an authenticity, there has to be a sincerity within the culture, within the environment, within the workplace, so that people feel comfortable and free and secure coming forward. And that means that leaders need to take responsibility. That's part of what leadership is. We don't need ministers who, in, in response to criticism about their performance, for example, if that's what's coming forward from a whistleblower, allege that that's an attack on civil servants. That's unhelpful. Unfortunately, we, we hear that all the time on this side of the House, and it almost never is. It's a criticism of the ministers and the senior leadership who are failing to provide the adequate leadership and the direction that our civil servants expect and deserve in their jobs. You can appreciate why civil servants feel that there's a toxic culture when they get thrown under the bus for public convenience by the very people that they answer to. This motion, Motion 101, calls on government to launch a comprehensive education campaign to inform civil servants of their legal rights and their protections. And we need to ensure that workers, of course, are fully aware of their rights and all of the avenues that they have to raise their concerns. For example, we have a new ombudsperson office. Fantastic. Once again, the last province in Canada to institute one. But we have one, and that's fantastic. And that needs to be made clear to all of the public servants here in this province that that office is a place where you can go safely in order to raise these concerns. It's one of many, uh, one of many avenues that are available to you. But I don't know what efforts government has made to inform public servants that this new office even exists. This motion also calls on government to develop safe pathways for workers to raise their concerns. And we know that the substance of those concerns are very often extraordinarily significant. For example, some of the concerns we've heard in our office are about the quality of services that could affect the safety and the well-being of islanders. Really fundamental things. As I said at the very beginning, I look at whistleblowing as a sort of early warning protection within, within uh, the environments and the workplaces that, that we work. And, and if that is taken away, we lose that early warning system that could perhaps prevent some serious problems from, from building up and, and exposing themselves later. Workers should not have to rely on measures of last resort like going to the media or public communications to ensure that ministers and senior administrators take their concerns seriously. It should be something that's done in-house. And, ex and it's extremely worrying that this is the environment that this government is providing for its civil servants. 
I really hope in debate of this motion that we hear examples from this government of things that they are doing to improve the working conditions for island public servants. I really hope we hear in debate on this motion that this government is going to take steps to educate public servants, to let them know what needs to be done, to strengthen the Whistleblower Act, perhaps, to make sure that the Ombudsperson Office is well advertised, if I can put it that way, within the public service, and that, most importantly, the ministers, the deputy ministers, the leaders in this organization, the, the provincial government of Prince Edward Island, will create an atmosphere, a workplace, an environment where every single public servant feels safe, they feel secure, and they feel able to tell the truth if that's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll go to the seconder of the motion, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition for his remarks. Um, on the context of this motion. It, it has been indeed quite um, really challenging actually for members of the Official Opposition Caucus to hear some of these stories, not some of the stories, all the stories, over and over and over again um, from people who we hear regularly accolades and thanks in the House, um, but who are then contacting us often um, frightened and ensuring, uh, insisting on anonymity because they have things to share that, that, that can't be said in public. There's such a difference between those two stories. Um, and I think we all know and love people who work um, in, in what we consider essential services um, in the public sector, either you know friends and relatives, members of our family, um, people we're close to who tell us, you know, wait, you know, wait until I tell you what it's really like, but you can't tell anybody because if you do, I'll lose my job. Um, you know, we have a long history in PEI of, of patronage and of political appointments and of kind of that's the way it always is. And one of the places where that remains is in the public sector, um, in spaces that should have protections like unions, um, like, you know, legislation, um, policies. Um, but the gap between all those kind of structures and processes that are in place and what they actually look like in the real world is really large. It has to be absolutely awful. It has to be impossible for somebody to get to the point where they think that they can phone somebody and say, I have to tell you about what's going on when they feel that worried, or to get to the point where they actually make a formal complaint. Um, I certainly know from my own personal experience and experience of others around me, to get to the stage where you go and complain to your HR manager or to a senior, it has to have gotten really bad. So that means, like with any other um, challenge or issue, whether it's you know in, in, in different spaces in different jurisdictions, no matter what else that looks like, for every one person that reports, there are how many behind them who aren't who don't feel they have that confidence or don't understand that they can or don't know that that system is there or just don't feel brave enough that day. Um, and we don't know because, that's, again, this is, this is, it's, it's shameful and it's hidden and it's secret. And so, you know, I, I think a lot about that. I think a lot about how brave it is when people do speak up and how incredibly difficult it must be for those people who don't feel that they can do that for whatever the reason. One of the things that we have to talk about is what does unsafe or toxic workplaces, what do those actually look like? Because it's, it's not, it's a very general statement, it's also a very broad one. And, and the short answer is they do not look the same for everybody. The experience of an unsafe workspace could look very different if you are a woman or a man, or if you're a person of a visible minority, or if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, or if you are all of those things. It could look very different if you're new or if you're English as a second language. It could look different if you're older. It could look different if you've been sick or if you're a parent, um, if you have a different qualification or education or experience. So everybody's experiences are different, and that means that we also have to be open to the idea that what someone else may say when they say, I do not feel safe. May, you, may, you may look at that and say, well, I don't see what your problem is. In fact, we hear that all the time, people saying they're dismissive of other people's experiences. And that's one of the really big challenges around this is your lived experience 
cannot be dismissed by somebody else who hasn't had that experience. How you feel is true. And if you feel unsafe, or if you feel threatened, or if you feel ill from work or scared or any of those things, then that is a true thing. And you have to be treated with respect and care, even if the person that you are having to deal with on that one doesn't have that experience and doesn't understand that experience. It doesn't mean it isn't true. The other thing that we hear a lot about this is, well, why does it matter? We've got so much else that we have to do when we're talking about workplaces. Why does investing in culture, the culture of a workplace, why would that matter? In fact, I know some people who have actually had a job called the chief cultural officer of an organization. And it's a real thing. And it's a real thing because it really matters. Because what the culture of an organization does is it sets the tone and the values of an organization. Your culture tells people who you are. And if your culture says that you don't protect the people who are working for you and giving up all of their living daily life to come and do that work, that you don't value them, or you don't value their health, their mental health, their physical health, that you don't want to provide an environment where they feel safe, then you are not going to have a culture that, that supports creativity or innovation or productivity. Because those things can only happen in a culture where people are respected and valued. So if you go into a workspace on a regular basis where you are not safe or respected or valued, why would you expect somebody to give 110% or to come up with the latest great big idea or to solve the problem? We can't expect our people to step up and do more and be awesome if you've told them that they are not valued. So culture is not some woke day, word of the day. Okay, culture is who you are and how you identify yourself and how you describe what your company and your organization is to others. Disney's culture is to be the happiest place on earth. I don't know if it actually is, but that's their culture. And having a culture that doesn't value the people who we stand up regularly in this house and say are the most important people we have in our space is going to mean that we have the exact opposite of what we want and need from our public service. We are not going to have a space that, that encourages and empowers the people who work there to do the greater good. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the time has expired for speaking to this motion, so I would adjourn debate, seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition. Shall I carry? Honourable Member from Morale Dona and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move uh, seconded by the member from Charlottetown Winslow that the 30th order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number 30, an act to amend the St. Dunstan's University Act, Bill number 200, ordered for third reading. The Honourable Member from Morale Dona and the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown Winslow that the said bill be now read a third time. Shall I carry? carry. Bill number 200, an act to amend the St. Dunstan's University Act, read a third time. The Honourable Member from Morale Dona and the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Member from Charlottetown Winslow, that the said bill do now pass. Honourable Members, this is a bill introduced by Leave of the House, read a first time. Read a second time, committed to the committee of the whole house, reported, agreed to, without amendment, read a third time, and is now moved that the bill do now pass. All those in favor say yea. Yay. Contrary, nay. Honorable member, your bill passed unanimously. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Moraldona that the first order of the day be now read. 
Shall I care? <coughs> Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. By the member from Raldona, that this house do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole house to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Shall I care? The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now to committed to the whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Right. We are on page 71. The section Water and Air Monitoring has been read and is currently under debate. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Kelly Bulger, Director of Finance, Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you very much. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I, I would love to ask, we had a lot of conversations earlier on about what the high capacity study uh, was going to actually do, the study on high capacity wells. Can you give me a sense of what this study actually studied? Because that was something we struggled to get clarity on at one point. Sure, we'll bring that back. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Do you happen to know if that's going to be an ongoing study? Did we get the results we're looking for on that. Is there money for that to continue in this budget? There's no no dollars in fiscal 22-23, um, but we can bring back what the outcomes were and what the future looks like. So much well. Thank you, Chair. I'd appreciate that because I was of the impression it was going to be a multi-year study. This was going to be ongoing. So I did think there was going to be additional dollars associated with it, but I, I stand to be corrected on that. Somerset Wilmot. Okay, thank you, Chair. Another question that I do have, will there be, um, I know that the member from Tignish Palmer Road brought in a bill that was going to increase water monitoring. I'm just curious if there's going to be additional dollars necessary for that to happen, for water testing to happen in people's homes. For the free water analysis? Exactly. Yes, you'll see that in um, drinking water management as well as the PEI oh. analytical apps. Not under water monitoring. I apologize. I'll save my question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Charlotte, I'm West Royalty. Yeah, I'm just curious the, the, to conduct air quality monitoring. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Like, how does it? how does it work? Like, are you talking about outside or indoors or? I believe that's outside monitoring. It's outside. Outside, yes. Is it done? Is it done regularly? Like, are you are you looking for big fluctuations in, in quality? Like, how do you measure that? I, I would have to to get back to you on that, but I do know it's done regularly. They have monitoring stations stationed throughout the the island, um, and. Um, what they're monitoring for, certainly I can bring that back. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, that's, that's all I had. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions on that. Show section carry. Yeah. 
Drinking water and wastewater no. management appropriations brought out to administer approvals, regulatory compliance, and protection related to water wells. Drinking water and wastewater systems for the administration of the Water Act regulations, including well construction, water quality investigations, and other related services. Administration 8,500, equipment 13,000, material supplies and services 8,900, professional services 7,000, salaries 560,600, travel and training 37,100, total drinking water and wastewater management 635,100. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. As you may recall, the uh, chair had brought forward a piece of legislation regarding um, <laughs> free water testing. I may have discussed it at some point as well, um, regarding uh, free water, water testing for residents who live in uh, outside incorporated municipalities that have uh, water systems. Um, is there, there were, at the time we talked about significant additional costs to deliver that, is that reflected? Because I don't really see it showing up in this space uh, yes there are so in this section here there are two new positions we okay. had existing dollars we were able to fund um, one position from within okay and then you'll also see further costs over in the, the lab section in the lab area yes that makes sense okay thanks for that have you um, has that change taken effect already are those test free tests being available now yes they are and have you seen any increase in the number of tests submitted since the change took effect? Yes. I know that's sort of very immediate, but I'm hoping you've got some analysis. Oh, I can just go to the lab. That is in the lab section. Okay. Um, okay. Do well, you want to <coughs> cover it now or wait? We're going to wait. Okay. I believe between uh, January and March um, this year compared to last year, there was an additional about 900 tests. Wow. Yep. Good. Free works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Funny how that was. That's great. Well, okay. Thank you for that. That's all I've got in that section, Chair. Shall I section carry? Carry, carry. Microbiology and chemistry laboratories, appropriations provided for the microbiological and chemical analysis of drinking water, surface water, and wastewater. Administration 47,700, equipment 20. Equipment 33,500, material supplies and services 263,900, professional services 10,500, salaries 892,300, travel and training 4,100. Total of microbiology and chemistry laboratories 1,252,000. Charlottetown Belvedere. Referencing in the previous discussion, I know when we had heard about this initially on the floor when we were talking about the legislation, you had estimated at that time that the costs were going to be about a million and a half, but I'm, I'm to do the, the kind of potential expanded lab testing, but I'm not seeing that kind of level of financial commitment in this section or the previous one that we just discussed. I do see sort of salary increase, um, but not a substantial additional cost. Uh, I know that that is outsourced to the the lab thing, so, so where... Did we just did you just overestimate how much it was, or is, is there that showing up somewhere else? I believe that encompassed also the lost revenue as well. Okay. So um, between section the drinking water section and the lab section, um, and lost revenue, it's about nine hundred ninety-three thousand dollars. Okay. So the cost, so the, the the net cost, the That's opportunity correct. cost on this is a nine hundred thousand dollar revenue loss. <clears throat> okay. But you said nine hundred tests in a quarter already. Okay. I think that's a fair trade. Um, the, the other thing that I just note in this section um, is that it mentions about uh, what wastewater testing. And I know we've seen wastewater testing being used in other jurisdictions to assess um, the level of um, COVID um, in, that, that's, that's prevalent in the, in the community. Um, it's been quite effective in, in other jurisdictions to, to assist in kind of balancing out the other data. There has been a discussion about that happening here. Has that, where are we at that? Is that going to be happening through this or in coordination with this section? There is an initiative coming forward um, in, the, in fiscal 22-23 that will perform that testing. Okay. And is that going to be funded out of CPHO? Um, I, we will be funding what I understand, I just heard this today, um, the shipping costs okay. to the lab. Um, the national lab, um, and it would probably be funded through the COVID contingency, um, which would rest with finance. Which would make sense. Assuming yeah. approved, yes. Yeah. Okay, so breaking here. 
Break, um, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> breaking news. Breaking you get news. the breaking news headline of the day. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, page Wayne. Um, what, when do you expect that to start? Um, I, just, that you just, learned I today? just heard about it today. So, okay, yeah. maybe a little premature then. All right, I'll check back in. Um, I think I'm good for that section, Chair. Shall the section carry? Sorry. Agricultural outreach appropriations provided to administer pesticide management programs in the Agriculture Environment <laughs> Officer Unit. Administration 6,300. Equipment 4,500, material supplies and services 15,500, professional services 37,000, salaries 323,900, travel and training 32,100, total agricultural outreach 419,300. Charlotte Hamilton, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, how many support calls do envi the agricultural environmental officers make in a run of the year? Like, I understand that's the kind of primary role. They had um, up to December, 20, uh, December 31st of 2021, there were 223 interactions. Okay. Um, they, have, they vary in terms of what the, what the issue was. Right. <clears throat> so so there's, there's not really a trend in terms of increase, decrease? You have to kind of um, ballpark it? I haven't got the year to year. I certainly can, yeah. can um, bring that back. The most common ones were buffer zone. Um, let me go over here. Yeah, buffer zone was predominantly headlands. Yeah, um, which would make sense. Yes. Um, and but you'd also talked about pesticide management is one of the other primary ones that, that's listed in there, which I guess connects to buffer zones too to some extent. What's the coordination and and cost coordination with um, the federal oversight on pesticide management? Does that appear? Is that relevant in this section at all? Because I know like CFIA has our, our PM. PMRA, I think, is it that has the has a federal requirement for that too? So, there are no federal offset dollars in this budget. Okay. So it doesn't appear in this piece. Um, and you said you would be able to bring back sort of what it looks like, just sort of kind of break down between the different kinds yes. of calls. That'd be really helpful. Just just looking in terms of, especially as we sort of begin to have more complexity in 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 potentially with things like buffer zones and and different programs around that. I'm just wondering if you if you're anticipating that this, this section needing to be boosted to sort of help support some of that work. Um, I mean because right now it looks like you've got maybe a bit of a salary bump but otherwise it's not sort of a real shift in the in the budget. Well it's a bit so is that something that might be on the plan going forward? Okay. Okay, I'm good for there. Shall the section carry? Environmental land management appropriations provided to administer and coordinate the environmental assessment and subdivision review process, environmental per permitting, contaminated sites, oil spill response, and to administer watercourse and wetland protection regulations. Administration 15,500, equipment 7,700, material supplies and services 8,100, professional services 65,800, salaries 874,400, travel and training 48,700, grants 50,000, total environmental land management 1,070,200. Uh, Cheryl Tom Belvedere. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of conversations recently around incidents and, the, uh, and um, you know, environmental assessment and, and responses, which, which definitely are relevant in this section, one of them being the oyster lease impact where you announced that you were increasing the fine um, that was appropriate. And then the other one is more recently around the incident in Brookvale, which was obviously a provincial contractor or contractor, contractor who had been hired by the province to do work on behalf of the province in the provincial park. Can you give an update on um, what's happening with that Brookvale incident and, and how it, <coughs> how it is uh, reflected. I'm assuming it falls in this section. Do you have any more questions than I have? No. Um, I know that we we're currently monitoring the site, but generally in, in our case, we, if we investigate something and determine that something was done out of the ordinary, it would go to justice. So we would send it to justice because we don't have any enforcement agents. Okay. So it, it had gone to them. Okay. And where it lies is with them, and uh, we and the other one, the oyster lease one. We were back out there a week ago, um, checking in on 
if all of the things that were meant to be done were done. So we're keeping an eye on okay. it. Okay. Um, and, and part of the reason for asking that in terms of the context of the budget is, you know, the, the budget's pretty stable. But, you know, I'm wondering about how, where do the costs come when you, if you have to do remediation? Right, because where you're talking about basically fixing something, like, you know, where there has been significant damage and impact, I get that there is, a, a, like, a justice piece in there, but the expertise to actually do that remediation is going to sit in your department. So, so where would that cost come from? Well, it would, only be it would in. just be staff time. I think we would mm -hmm. send somebody out and say, here's the re remediation, you have to plant trees or you have to, to do this, and then the cost would... You, you, it, if you were the person that we were directing to do it, you would bear the cost. Okay. But if, I mean, if you have something that drags on, like legal processes aren't quick. So yeah. if you have something that drags on, but you've got like a season to recover the brook so that the brook trout can come back, don't, don't, don't you go in and in the meantime and at least do something, you know, I know that for instance, even just sort of something to prevent silt runoff is yeah. not, cheap always to put in but but you would need to do it right away you don't have time to talk about we it. would order it done I guess if if we if we didn't I don't like we would have to find money but it wouldn't be necessarily here in this budget well part of the reason for asking is because I've asked a couple of times around if we have a climate contingency fund and this yeah. is an example of where a climate climate contingency fund would actually allow the department to be able to go and and at least get put something in. There could be a recoverable cost, but that's what contingencies can let you do, right? They, they mean that you don't have to say, well, I can't do that because we don't have the money right now. Okay. Um, and, and I just, it's not the only example, but it's a really immediate one um, sure. where, where the ability to be able to sort of step up. Yep. Um, I think we'll take that under advisement. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay. Um, no, I, I appreciate the clarification about, about the, the, the role. I mean, the other one that I note in here is, is oil spill response. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of conversations around things that have been happening on a municipal basis around that. Um, and I'm just wondering about the, where you have environmental land management and then you have environmental protection which sits in a different space. What's the core, where does the, like, is it a bit of a blurry line between, between some of those things? Because when I see oil spill or contaminated sites, I think much more about environment, environmental protection and public safety than I do environmental land. Right, like I know the initial thing that, but the, the long term effect of that sits in a different space. So, how does that get coordinated? Or does it? Boy, I'd have to get back to you, unless no. you haven't. No, well, we would have to get back to you with that. I, don't, I, I couldn't confidently answer okay. that. Okay. No, and I understand it is, it is a complex, complex piece, but it, it is, for instance, remediating and managing contaminated sites is incredibly expensive and takes yeah. a really long time um, and involves, like I said, multiple different legislative spaces. Um, so I'm just, it's, it's about that kind of coordination and cost because some of those things could be in the millions just for a site if you have, if you get. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I know we've yeah. seen that, right? So, yeah, um, yeah okay, that would be something I'd, I'd nice to follow up on. Um, yeah. And I'm afraid I didn't catch it when we talked around it the first time around, but we've got Justice of Public Safety coming up, so I'll add it in to my questions there for Justice in Public Safety as well, I think. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Okay. I'm good for there. Thank you. Charlton, what's royalty? Thank you, Chair. I mean, we're, the, the member was just talking about, you know, contaminated sites, so I just kind of wanted to look at, um, there's, there's a site in my district 479 University Avenue, it's Rankin McLean, old car dealership, the cat dealership. And we're looking at it, and I, I mean, when you look at contaminated sites, you're like, oh, if it's contaminated, everybody just kind of backs off and says, we're going to look at it some other time. Yeah. But, but this is, I look at this, and uh, what can we do? What can we do to have a conversation? I mean, the property's up for sale, but it's contaminated. It just seems like we're, we're, we're stalled with these areas of our province, and especially in Shelltown, it's 4.5 acres. Um, you know, how do we, I'm asking the minister, how do we, do, what, well, what do we do? It's a, I don't know, to be honest, it's a really <clears throat> great question, but I mean, it's, it has to be solvable. It has to be something where we can sit down and put our heads together and say, let's figure this out, because it is a, that'd be a, a prime, spot yeah it's a big spot and it would be prime for a number of things so yeah. i don't know i'm more than willing to help try to figure it out okay. but you know obviously i'd have to talk to the technicians first to make sure that yeah i knew what i knew what what they actually knew yeah 
And I mean, I, I'd like to, to, I'm going to start to push a little bit more, especially on that site, to figure out between federal, provincial, and municipal, we have to figure out what we what we do with that space. Um, and I just don't know. I don't know what the costs are, and, and I know, but it, it's 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 got to be done for for our future generations. So, yeah. yeah. If you want to come in, I'll put the right, right people in the room, and you can see if we can yeah. sort it out. Let's do it, and bring yeah, okay. a couple other ministers in too. Sure. Okay. Um, on the grant section, uh, $50,000, uh, you, you looked at it, it was 89, you were forecasting last year, it was 54 that you spent. Um, why are the grant section in that just a, just seems a little bit lower or maybe trending in the wrong direction? So in the current, in fiscal 21-22, we had the species at risk on agricultural land um, and the contribution from the federal government next year is going down to 20,000. So that's the drop down to 20 next year. <clears throat> oh, so the federal government's not putting it, they, they gave you extra money for a specific project? Yes, so it's 79.6 over two years, 59.6 in 21-22, and $20,000 in 22-23. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, and I noticed that your salaries are up uh, a little bit. What are, what are those positions for? <clears throat> we have a new environment officer position. Okay. All right. Um, and in the big book, um, energy rebates, uh, residential electricity, uh, 7.4 million dollars. That's that's a that was money that was given back to Islanders for energy projects. Fantastic. Just straight back on your bill. Okay. Yeah. And then some of the other things, uh, energy rebates, propane was was quite a bit lower. Is there is are we are we doing enough around propane and then wood pellets and firewood but just about propane well it's a rebate that we're not convinced that we're has longevity because it's a fossil fuel mm -hmm. so I we probably see that being reduced over a period of time hopefully quick yeah no I'm just trying to like with this section I'm trying to look at I think that's a that's that's a energy rebate is really positive and where do you see that going in the in the future which oh, one from here and the uh, wow. residential electricity energy rebate? oh no we talked about this earlier when I was on earlier in the day but I think that it's there's question whether or not that money could be more appropriately spent because everybody gets a 10 percent right across the board and there may be people who could benefit more than others like I'm yeah. not sure that I need to get 10 percent off my bill that money could be used to help somebody make changes that could lower their household costs. Yeah. So how do you expect to do that sooner rather than later? I mean, we're in a four-year cycle. How do we gonna? <laughs> I know it's it's, a, it's it, uh, when I had said earlier is all we talked about a lot of these things, and then we had this energy crunch that we're in where the prices went up on fossil fuels rapidly, and mm -hmm. it was in the middle of winter and impacted people. So it was like, boy, well, you can't start taking things away now. Mm -hmm. When people are are hurting, so we have to. If we we're going to make a change, we we would just redeploy the money. We wouldn't. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to see the money go away. I'd want to have the money in our department to do other things. So, what are the other things? I think we'd like to have a rock solid plan so that when we when we do that, when we make the change, we can say, this is going away, but it's going here. Mm -hmm. So you'll still benefit from it mm -hmm. if you're in, you know, yeah. lower income brackets. Yeah. No, thanks a lot for them, and I think it's it's that's important that, that we're obviously having that discussion and yeah. look forward to that. Yeah. That's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Shall section carry? Yeah. Waste reduction, recovery, and recycling appropriations provided for the operation of beverage container program, the management of the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, the reduction of the single-use products, and the oversight of the extended producer responsibility program. Administration 2000, equipment 6000, material supplies and services 7,005,000, salaries 170,800, travel and training 9,400, grants 115,000, total waste reduction, recovery, and recycling 7,308,200. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, I am a little challenged on sort of what this section, how this relates, given that we've got Island Waste Management Corporation, and I think I was wondering if you could unpack it a bit. Like, what is the next food producer responsibility program? Um, which program are you looking at? The extended, well, extended producer responsibility program. Excuse me. Um, EPR programs, 
MPI, all are free and regulated versus volunteer model. Programs are primarily funded by environmental handling fees. Okay. Either shown on receipts such as new electronics or embedded into the product oh, pricing. Right. Yeah, so that's where you pay the fee when you purchase the item and then, then that covers the cost of the recycling down the road, like TV or... And same with the bottles and the bottle and cans. It's kind of an in and out. So the seven million dollar in a in material supply services, that is that the contracting fees that we pay to the recycling depots? So I remember having this conversation in a, at least previous years and it was just there's these existing contracts with recycling depots to take the I think that's that fees, is that correct? Yes it is. Yes. Okay. Look at me go. Um, how often are those contracts renegotiated? Um, have the dates. Do, they, do they roll over annually or? No, not annually. We do have, I believe, have the dates here. Um, the one with the depots uh, runs out to 24-25. Okay. Um, the recycler, 24-25 um, as well. And um, our administrator, also 25. And again, I may be recalling, please correct me, but the, I, I believe that that kind of, there was some recovery of, there's recovery of cost because of the value of the recyclable items themselves when they when they come in, or there's something around that, but I'm not quite sure. Like we, so the deposit is charged on the item at point of sale. This is the contract that's paid to the recycling depots to run the recycling for bottles, glass, metal, and so on. How does the province recover any of those funds? Through the sale of the aluminum and the plastic through right. the Department of Finance. Right. Okay. So we had some a couple of years ago. We had some challenges with plastic being sold. Was at one point being you know where was it going? And there was conversations about things going to China or going to wherever. Where where does our plastic go now? I would have to bring that back. Okay. So I mean, I, I get this. Would it be better to ask that Department of Finance? Does it actually come under your responsibility, or is it under the Finance Department? So I'm happy to ask it there. Oh, I could actually, I have it right here actually. Oh, yeah. Plastic is going to Nova, uh, Nova Pet. Okay, yeah. And that's an Amherst. Yeah. And cans are going to Novellus. I that's believe Quebec. that's an, I thought it was an American, but um, well, I, it could I know be. there's an aluminum recycling plant in Quebec as well, but we don't, I don't know which one is which, so. Okay. Are we doing recycling for Tetra Packs? Um, Lynn says yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Intervention from Summerside Wilmot. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I was asked the other day as well, and I'm like, oh. Um, okay. Um, I'm good on that. Cheryl, Town Brighton. Uh, I was wondering how much you spent on the plastic. Bag Reduction Act, which is obviously a very successful project. Has that been costing you anything? Not in fiscal 21-22. Okay. It was in, I believe, 2021, uh, maybe 1920. It was 20. Yeah, 1920. Do you have anything further up your sleeves, like a coffee cup reduction act, for instance? Uh, <laughs> or are you waiting for the opposition to... Uh, well, we were kind of waiting on the federal government. They were supposed to be aggressive on theirs, but I recently had a conversation where I'm getting tired of waiting. Mm -hmm. yep. So anyway, I think we're going to have to go back to the table and talk to ourselves. Yep. But we'll... Okay, thank you. Charlottetown Brighton? No, I'm okay. You're good. Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere? Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to follow up on that because I, I recall it has been announced a number of times about sort of doing some, some aggressive work around reduction of plastics. Yeah. in other spaces because of the success of the plastic bag bill, blah, 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 that. Um, Single-use plastics and other pieces. And, and yes, agreed, the federal government hasn't seemed to make it a priority in the last couple of years. Um, where, what, what work would you need to do within the department to be able, like, is there something that, that we would need to see from as a, like a study or, or something, or do you already have work done on that? Yeah, I think they would have, they have an, quite a bit of the work done and we would be involved in some of those national conversations yeah. and national tables so we would have a lot of information ourselves and we can probably just expedite it and do it and get it done yeah my that's my feeling anyways yeah 
Charlottetown Bell. Well, and, and the plastic bag ban bill. Oh my gosh, that's hard. Um, was, you know, ended up. It, it, there was an initial cost in the rollout and, and so on, but it has been, you know, incredibly effective. And we've talked before about sort of the, the measurable reduction in waste. Okay. Um, even if I do miss grocery bags every now and then for when I'm out with my dog, but um, there are there are um, some significant. Again, when we talked about sort of a jurisdiction that can pull something like this off, that was the example that was given at the time when we went with the plastic bag bill. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I know that within this space, there again, there's not that flexibility isn't isn't there, but but it, it would fit in in terms of if necessary. Again, contingency maybe. <laughs> I'm going to make keep pitching that contingency fund. Um, Oh, I'm all in. I'll do it. Oh, you won't criticize it. No problem. Oh, well, that's okay. I get to do both. I get to be the champion one and criticize it. That's how I'll it works. Take, I'll take a contingency fund any day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Char Charlottetown Belvedere. No, I'm good. That's good. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Call the hour. The hour has been called. Oh, that was quick. We only have two left. We're going to do that. Uh, chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having, under, having had under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Charlotte Carey. The Honourable Member from Molecule Kilmore and the Government Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House adjourn until. Wednesday, April 27th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Seconded, Seconded by the member from Cornwall Meadowbank. <laughs> Are you sure? Sean Carey. Yeah. <laughs>